Good evening, and welcome to this public information sharing session and public hearing on Mexican wolf management. Uh, my name is Dave Case uh, with DJ Case and Associates and the moderator uh, for tonight's session. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is contracted with DJ Case to provide logistical support and facilitation of tonight's session. Uh, I'm joined this evening by Rick Clausen and Cindy Longmire, both with DJ Case, who are helping on the kind of the technical side and looking after the meeting, meeting platform and and technical issues uh, as we go forward. Aside from Rick and uh, Cindy and I, uh, uh, everyone else you see at tonight's meeting here is from the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and we'll introduce them here shortly. Uh, but first, since we are uh, meeting in the virtual space instead of in person, unfortunately, I'd like to take a few minutes to explain uh, how this section uh, will work. Uh, this meeting has two parts. Um, the first part is information sharing. Uh, staff from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will present uh, information on proposed changes to the 10-J rule. And then there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions about anything that was presented. Uh, the second half of the meeting from 7 to 9 p.m. Mountain Time uh, will be the public hearing, uh, the chance for you to make formal comments on the proposed rule uh, uh, for, for the record. Here's the agenda for a meeting. I'll start by explaining the format and the ground rules, and then next representatives from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will introduce uh, themselves. Uh, then Amy Luters, a regional director for the uh, Interior Region 6 and 8, will provide opening remarks to, to set the stage. Uh, following that, Tracy Melvis, will, um, the, the Mexican Wolf Policy Coordinator, will make a presentation to give us an overview of the, the proposed rule. After the presentation, we'll conduct a question and answer session again uh, in which the Fish and Wildlife Service will answer questions you may have about the specific questions about the proposed changes. Uh, the the Q&A session, we're going to have a hard stop at 6.45 uh, p.m. Mountain Time. We'll take a break then, a 15-minute break, and come back at 7 p.m. and conduct the formal hearing, in which we look uh, forward to hearing your comments on the Mexican wolf proposed rule. We are on a Zoom web webinar tonight, so we have a few quick ground rules to pass along. Just step step through those. Uh, the session is being recorded, and a transcript will be uh, posted on the Mexican Wolf Recovery website uh, within three business days. So, if you know of anyone who could benefit from this information but couldn't participate today, um, please share the link, uh, which we'll pass along here shortly. Second, um, participant microphones and video are are turned off for the presentation. A third, the serv the service will take questions and provide answers for about forty five minutes, as I, as I mentioned. They'll answer as many questions as possible, um, but no additional time will be given for the Q&A after 645, because we want to make sure the service staff wants to make sure that they focus on comments in the public hearing, which from seven to nine. So we don't want to eat up any of that, that time from seven to nine. Uh, if you have questions uh, that you'd like to submit under part of the Q&A, please submit them at um, one at a time uh, by clicking the Q&A button, uh, which you can find at the bottom of your screen uh, in the Zoom toolbar. Uh, please don't submit multiple questions in a single screen. It's mostly just you can submit as many questions as you want, but it's real helpful to have one at a time so that we can uh, manage those as part of the Q&A session in case people ask the exact same question. Uh, number five is please be respectful uh, when answering questions. Uh, we don't anticipate any problems here, but, but note that if, if you use profanity or inappropriate language, um, we reserve the right to dismiss the question and, and move on. Uh, if you are joining us by phone, we'll have separate instructions for how to ask your questions um, at the beginning of the Q&A session. Uh, it's a little bit of a different process if you're listening in by phone. Then at the end of the Q&A session, we'll take a 15 minute break, as I mentioned, and then start the formal comment, uh, comment hearing uh, period. The, the, the formal comment period will last two hours. We'll take any verbal comments, um, take as many verbal comments as we can within that two hour time frame. Um, we have assembled a list of everyone who, um, uh, who registered and indicated they wanted to provide formal comment. We'll proceed that through that list in the order that people registered. And if there's time available, uh, we'll provide an opportunity for um, uh, anyone who did not register but would like to testify to provide the comments if, if we have the time. Um, we'll provide instructions about that session, uh, how that session will run at the beginning of the comment period. We'll also, we, we really want to get through all of the registered uh, people that have registered and, and have comments. Uh, so we, we're, 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 we'll, we'll go ahead and extend um, if needed um, to, to fit everybody in. We'll extend the meeting until 9.30 if we need to do that to get all the registered commenters uh, in. 
Uh, if you need it, uh, the captioning is available. You can view the captioning by clicking on the, uh, the CC button on the, the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the posted recording will also be, be captioned uh, if, if that's helpful to you uh, and you want to review it again later. <laughs> I know that's a lot of instructions um, uh, to take in a few minutes, but don't worry. Um, we'll go back over those instructions um, for submitting questions and providing comments after, after the presentation. So with that, um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Brady McGee, the Wolf Recovery Coordinator with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to kick it off. Brady? All right. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Brady McGee. I am the Mexican Wolf Recovery Coordinator for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service located in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Joining me today are Amy Luders, Regional Director for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Albuquerque. Tracy Melbahas, our Mexican Wolf Policy Coordinator. Maggie Dwyer, our Deputy Mexican Wolf Recovery Coordinator. And John Oakleaf, our Mexican Wolf Field Projects Coordinator. This evening, we will provide an overview of the service's proposed changes to the management regulations for Mexican wolves in the Mexican wolf experimental population area in Arizona and New Mexico under Section 10J of the Endangered Species Act. Our press release, frequently asked questions, the following slide deck and additional information are available on our website at the link on your screens. We will share this slide again at the end of the evening. With that, I would like to turn it over to Regional Director Amy Luders to begin the information session. Well, thank you, Brady, and thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. We appreciate the participation of everyone in our session tonight. Before we get into the details of the proposed rule revision, I'd like to first acknowledge our Mexican Wolf Recovery Partners. Throughout this process, we have collaborated closely with the states of Arizona and New Mexico, as well as many federal, local, and tribal partners. We invited 60 agencies to serve as cooperating agencies during this process. On the screen, you'll see the list of 24 who accepted and signed the Memorandum of Understanding to serve as cooperating agencies. During nearly a dozen meetings with these cooperating agencies, we developed and provided working drafts of the Draft Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement. We solicited feedback and incorporated recommendations to the maximum extent possible. We also met several times with the Mexican Wolf Tribal Working Group, a working group open to all tribes and attended other tribal coordination meetings to discuss the rural revision. I want to thank all of these partners for their time, expertise and support in drafting a rule that if finalized, will bring our management actions in line with our recovery goals for the Mexican Wolf. Recovering the Mexican wolf remains a top priority of the Fish and Wildlife Service, and we continue to make steady progress toward this goal. The wild population of Mexican wolves in the United States saw its fifth consecutive year of growth in 2020. With a minimum of 186 Mexican wolves in the wild, the population is the largest it's ever been. We are now in the process of preparing for the 2021 count and hope to have good news to share on that front in the coming months. In a moment, Tracy is going to give you an in-depth overview of the specific changes being proposed in the 10J rule, but I want to leave you with two key takeaways. First, the 2017 Mexican Wolf Recovery Plan will continue to serve as our roadmap to recovery. And second, this proposed 10J revision will not lessen our ability to manage for conflict on the landscape. The service and the Mexican Wolf Interagency field team will continue to work diligently to prevent, reduce, and compensate for negative economic impacts felt by affected stakeholders. With that, I'll turn things over to Tracy Melbahess. All right. Thank you, Amy, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. I'll hold off for a quick minute till the slides come up. There we go. Okay, so I'd like to start with just a little bit of 
background on the Mexican wolf and our conservation efforts under the Endangered Species Act. Mexican wolf is the rarest subspecies of gray wolf in North America. And although it was once common throughout portions of the southwestern United States, the subspecies was all but eliminated from the wild by the 1970s. And in 1976, the Mexican wolf was listed as endangered under the Endangered Species Act. So this is a timeline that can be found on our website, and it shows some of the key milestones and regulatory actions uh, that we have taken. Two dates that I'll highlight very briefly are 1977, when recovery efforts for the species really began uh, with the effort to establish a captive population of Mexican wolves. And then in 1998, when Mexican wolves were first reintroduced back into the wild from captivity. And then along the bottom of the timeline, you can see major management actions supporting the recovery of the Mexican wolf, including the development of the 2015 10J rule, which revised the original 1998 designation of the Mexican wolf experimental population area in Arizona and New Mexico. And it is that 2015 10J rule for which we are proposing revisions. This slide provides a quick review of the process to revise the 2015 10G rule that got us here today. Namely in 2018, a federal judge remanded portions of the 2015 10G rule. And so we will continue to work with our partners to meet the deadline of delivering a final revised 10G rule by July 1st of 2022. On this slide, you can see a map that shows the Mexican wolf experimental population area, which consists of the portions of Arizona and New Mexico south of Interstate 40. There are three management zones in the Mexican wolf experimental population area, and these management zones establish areas for the release of Mexican wolves from captivity and areas for translocating wild wolves from one location to another. The geographic boundaries of the Mexican wolf experimental population area and the management zones will not be affected by our proposed revisions. So I'll now shift gears to talk about our current action, which is to revise our management regulations for the Mexican wolf experimental population area. The purpose of an experimental population under the Endangered Species Act is to conserve, uh, contribute to the conservation of the species. The court's remand of our 2015 10J rule requires the service to ensure that several specific features of the experimental population designation provide for the long-term conservation and recovery of the Mexican wolf, including its population size and genetic needs, and ensuring that the management actions we allow are protective of genetic diversity. And in addition, the remand requires a fresh essentiality determination under Section 10J of the ESA. So the proposed rule that we published at the end of October contains the following elements that would become part of the experimental population designation. And these include a revised population objective, a new genetic objective, temporary restriction of three existing take provisions, and again, a fresh essentiality determination. And I'll talk through each of these features, but first want to explain that these proposed revisions are intended to bring the management of the experimental population into alignment with the 2017 Mexican Wolf Recovery Plan first revision. That recovery plan provides our long-term vision, strategy, and goals for Mexican wolf recovery. And as some of you are aware, there was a recent court ruling also in October uh, that remanded part of the Mexican Wolf Recovery Plan back to the service. So we are moving forward to respond to that ruling, but the key takeaway for this process is that the judge did not remand the recovery criteria back to us. Therefore, we are moving forward with the proposed 10J rule revision to align our management of the experimental population with the overarching goals of the recovery plan while we simultaneously but separately respond to that court ruling. 
All right, first revision that I will briefly review is the population objective. The population objective describes how many wolves we will manage for, and it's intended to ensure the population is robust in size and has a low risk of extinction. So we're proposing to manage for an average of greater than or equal to 320 wolves in the Mexican wolf experimental population area, which will align with our recovery criteria for the Mexican wolf and the revised recovery plan. This proposed revision would remove the upper limit of 325 that our current regulations specify. Next, we are proposing a genetic objective for the Mexican wolf experimental population area. The, the genetic objective describes how many Mexican wolves we will release from captivity into the Mexican wolf experimental population area to improve the population's gene diversity and alleviate genetic threats such as inbreeding. Releasing wolves from captivity can improve gene diversity in the experimental population because Mexican wolves in the captive population have genes that are not currently represented in the wild. So we are proposing to release enough wolves from captivity that at least 22 survive to breeding age, which for Mexican wolves is about two years old. And as with the population objective, this genetic objective aligns with the recovery criteria for the Mexican wolves in the revised recovery plan. The next few revisions in our proposed 10J rule that I will review occur in our take provisions. Take provisions are essentially management actions that allow for the take of Mexican wolves. We are proposing to restrict three of our existing take provisions until the proposed genetic objective is reached. These three take provisions currently provide us with potential management flexibility to address conflict situations, but they could lead to the take of released wolves and hinder our progress to improve the genetic diversity of the population. The take provisions that we are proposing to temporarily restrict are take on federal land, take on non-federal land, and take in response to an unacceptable impact to a wild ungulate herd. Currently, our take provisions for federal land and non-federal land allow the service to issue permits to livestock operators to take a Mexican wolf in specific situations. We're proposing to restrict the issuance of these permits based on a conditional annual process. Under our proposal, take permits on federal and non-federal land would be issued to livestock operators in the year ahead, only if the service met our proposed annual benchmark for the number of released wolves surviving to breeding age in the previous year, or if we did not meet the benchmark, but permitted take in the previous year did not include released wolves. Our intention with this conditional permitting proposal is to ensure that permits as a form of management flexibility can be utilized, but only consistent with progress being made toward recovery. And then this restriction would be lifted when the service meets the proposed genetic objective. And it's important to note that the service could use other provisions in the rule to manage wolf livestock conflicts during years when permits are not given to livestock operators. And then the third take provision we are proposing to temporarily restrict is take in response to an unacceptable impact to a wild ungulate herd currently allows the state game and fish agencies to request the removal of wolves if wolf predation is having an unacceptable impact. <clears throat> and we are proposing to restrict this provision completely until the genetic objective is met. And the restriction would then be lifted when the service meets the proposed genetic objective. The last proposed revision in the proposed 10J rule is the essentiality determination. This determination is necessitated by Section 10J of the Endangered Species Act, which requires a determination of whether an experimental population is essential to the continued existence of a listed species. <clears throat> the Fish and Wildlife Service determined that the experimental population was non-essential in 1998 when we began reintroducing Mexican wolves to the wild. We have now updated our determination as the court required. We assessed the status of the experimental population, the population in Mexico, and the captive population, and still find the experimental population is not essential to the continued survival of the Mexican wolf. However, a non-essential determination does not mean unimportant, as the success of the experimental population is important 
to the recovery of the Mexican wolf. All right, I will now switch gears back to the documents that we have released for public comment. In addition to the proposed revised 10J rule, we also developed a draft supplemental environmental impact statement under the National Environmental Policy Act. As Amy mentioned, we worked with 24 cooperating agencies. We analyzed the impacts of our proposed revisions to land use, human health and public safety, biological resources, economic activity, and environmental justice. The draft supplemental environmental impact statement includes three alternatives, as you can see on the screen. Alternative one is our proposed action and preferred alternative, and it includes each of the revisions I've just described. Alternative two is a variation of alternative one that does not include the temporary restriction of the three take provisions. And then alternative three in this case is the no action alternative, which is to maintain the 2015 10J regulations without any revision. This infographic provides a little more detail still on our process to revise the management regulations from the time the 10J rule was remanded to us in 2018 until the completion of the process in, on July 1st, 2022. And you'll notice the red box highlighting our current action to hold public meetings, hearings, and conduct peer review. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is committed to providing robust opportunities for meaningful public participation in this rulemaking process. The proposal published in the Federal Register on October 29th and the 90-day public comment period will end on January 27th, 2022. On November 18th of 2021, the service held an information session on the proposed rule. We held a second information session following, uh, followed by our first hearing on December 8th, 2021, and recordings and transcripts from both of those days are available on our website. And then tonight is our final public information session and hearing. There are two ways to submit written comments for the record. You can submit your comments online through regulations.gov using the docket number on the screen, which I'll read off in a second for those of you who are on the phone. Or you can submit a hard copy of your written comments to uh, the address that is on the slide, which I will also read out loud now for phone participants. So online at regulations.gov, in the search bar, you can just search for Mexican wolf, but uh, even better would be to search for the docket number, which is FWS-R2-ES-2021-0103. And then the hard uh, copy, if you want to mail a hard copy to the mailing address on the screen, uh, that address is the first line, public comments processing. The second line is attention, and then the docket number, which is FWS-R2-ES-2021-0103. The third line of the mailing address is US Fish and Wildlife Service. The fourth line of the mailing address is MS for mail stop, PRB backslash, forward slash, slash 3W. <laughs> Fifth line is 5275 Leesburg Pike. That's L-E-E-S-B-U-R-G Pike. And then city and state is Falls Church, Virginia, which is VA 22041-3803. So uh, those again are the two ways to submit written comments. After reviewing all the information received during the public comment and peer review, service is going to continue working with partners, cooperating agencies, and tribes to publish that final rule by July 1st of 2022. And with that, I will turn it back over to our moderator to kick off the Q&A session. Great, thank you, Tracy. Um, we are going to jump into the Q&A session. I'd like to just kind of step through so a couple reminders. 
Um, first, the, 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 the first per portion of the, of the uh, input from you um, is, is, is not, this is not the formal hearing, but rather it's a chance for you to um, ask questions about the proposed rule. Um, are there things that you didn't understand or the things you want to know about the population uh, in relation to the proposed rule and so on. But really to make sure that people understand as much as, as, as they can. And we'll, we'll go until 645 and then and close off that discussion. A chance for you to comment. Um, Tracy mentioned a number of ways, but for, for you know, from seven to nine, um, that is set aside for us to, to take uh, comments from you and, and, uh, that we'll record and put, make part of the public record. So just a, a reminder that all of the participants, all of you are muted and, and in uh, listen only mode. Uh, if you have a question and you're online, um, click the Q&A button uh, in the Zoom toolbar, which is down at the bottom of the screen. Um, please enter in, as I mentioned, please enter and submit only one question at a time. That way, if there's multiple questions uh, that uh, people ask, we don't uh, keep asking the same questions. We'll sort some of those out. Again, we'll answer any questions uh, um, and make sure that we close off the Q&A period by 6.45. Uh, if you have additional questions, we invite you to visit the Mexican Wolf website. Uh, there you'll find, a, uh, as has been mentioned, find a list of frequently asked questions as well as uh, recordings of previous information sessions and, and uh, the, the presentations that you're seeing here today will be there as, as well. So um, if you, I, I do wanna uh, go through a separate description as I promised I would with, for people that are, are calling in by phone who don't have, are not online viewing this through the Zoom call, uh, through the Zoom uh, screen. If you're on the phone um, you can, and, and you wanna ask a question, um, press star nine to raise your hand. That'll tell us that you would like to ask a question. So you press star nine on your phone. Um, and we will, we will get to uh, some of those probably later in the quick Q&A um, session. Uh, and we'll, call it, we'll do that by, by um, asking, uh, the, by reading out the last four digits of your phone number uh, when, it's, when it's time. And, and we will get to those. Um, we'll call you on your number, and, and then when you to unmute yourself, you'll need to press star six. Um, we, we would ask that uh, you, you please state your name and, and, and ask your question when, uh, for those on the phone. Um, and recall that this is not a hearing, so we're not taking comments yet. We're, these are really just about trying to get more clarification and more insight. Uh, and whether you're on the phone or on, online, um, we ask you to keep the questions as brief and as succinct as, as possible so we can hopefully get through as many questions as possible. So with that, I'm going to pitch it back over to, um, to Brady uh, to kind of step us through the Q&A session. Thank you, Dave. To start off tonight's question and answer session, the first question I see is, how many wolves is considered a viable population? And I will take that question. According to our recovery plan uh, delisting criteria, we are trying to reach a goal of at least um, an average of 320 wolves over an eight year period in the US um, and a population of 200 wolves over that same eight year period uh, in Mexico. So that's what we are considering for downlisting criteria uh, to get it off the endangered species list to, and basically to be a viable population. Next question is, in what aspect of the proposed rule is the second wild population in Mexico being relied on? And I will turn that over to Tracy to answer. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Brady. So the regulations for the Mexican wolf experimental population area do only, um, they're only relevant for this area in the United States. The one place in the rule where we did look at the status of wolves in the wild in Mexico was in our essentiality uh, proposed determination where we looked at how many wolves are there and, and kind of their status over time since that reintroduction in 2010 began. Next question. The service claims that the wild U.S. wolves are non-essential. If the service has to use the captive population to cons constitute a wild population of about 200, how long does the SSP say it would take? And to answer that question, I will turn that over to Maggie. 
Okay, thanks, Brady. Um, since it's my first time speaking tonight, I'll introduce myself again. I'm Maggie Dwyer. I'm the Deputy Mexican Wolf Recovery Coordinator for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and in addressing the question, I don't have a specific numerical answer to how long that would take. Uh, to get to how long it would take to reestablish a population of 200 wolves, you'd have to look at the rate of releases from the captive breeding program, as well as the success of those releases in the wild. And I think a lot of people um, look at how long it took us to get to where we are now, but it would be important in this question to consider that we have 20 plus years of experience of do's and don'ts um, and compared to 1998 when we had none. So it would likely be quite a bit faster than it than it took this first time around. Next question. I understand that expanding the area for Mexican wolf occupancy in Arizona and New Mexico is not part of the proposed changes being considered. What happens to wolves that cross north of I-40? Um, and then there's another part to this. So wolves that cross north of I-40, um, then their status changes from um, an experimental population status to a fully endangered status. So while the um, Section 9 prohibitions of the Endangered Species Act apply to any Mexican wolf that wanders north of I-40. And then the second part of the uh, question is, do any of the proposed changes affect removal? So I will answer that as well. All the uh, proposed changes that we are talking about um, in this 10J revision only apply within the 10J. So when we establish um, a 10J, 10J experimental population, the act says we have to draw a line on the map um, and the reduced regulations or regulations that are set forth within that 10J apply within the line on the map. So everything we're doing with this 10J revision only applies um, within the lines uh, of the experimental population. So next question is, if the experimental population is in fact the total population, how can it not be essential? So I will turn that over to Tracy to answer. Okay. So in determining whether the population is essential or non-essential, we look at the status of the population in the Mexican wolf experimental population area, but then also uh, other wolves, which in this case would be the wolves in the wild in Mexico, as well as the captive breeding population. So in Mexico, there are currently about 40 wolves in the wild. Uh, Mexico began reintroducing wolves in 2010. So it's a much newer reintroduction, but they do have a population underway um, with some breeding pairs and reproduction going on. And then the captive population is a number of facilities in the US and Mexico, about 50 facilities that total right now, I think around 360 wolves. So we also consider the status of the captive population and Mexico in addition to the experimental population area. So as you were talking, Tracy, the next question popped up and you answered part of that question and said, how many Mexican wolves exist in Mexico? Um, and is that a stable population? So just to reiterate what you said, Tracy, there's about 30 to 40 wolves in the wild in Mexico. And with a number that small, it's not quite stable um, just yet. We're still uh, working with Mexico to increase the population down there. So next question is, um, can you please explain how maintaining non-essential designation, revising the 10J, or constitute a new essentiality determination? Um, I may not understand what the 10J is. So Tracy, would you provide a little more explanation? Yeah, so really this uh, ties back again to this court ordered remand that we had for our 2015 10J rule. So I'll just kind of backtrack to the very beginning. 
when we began reintroducing Mexican wolves in 1998, that was when we first established an experimental population. And so we made this determination, uh, again, that's required under Section 10J of the Endangered Species Act of whether or not it was essential. And in 1998, we said it was non-essential. Then in 2015, we revised the 10J designation. We expanded the area, we added management flexibility, added new take provisions, definitions, did all kinds of things. And we didn't revisit the essentiality determination because um, in the services thinking we had already designated the experimental population as non-essential. So we didn't really touch that part of the rulemaking process, um, but the judge uh, in the remand said that we do need to make a fresh or new essentiality determination. And so now we are in this kind of strange position where the experimental population is already well underway. We've been doing this for a few decades. Um, we are making these couple of changes. And so when we say that we're doing a new or a fresh essentiality determination, it just means that we need to re-justify um, why we think the population is essential or non-essential. And so we have now looked at, again, the, the status of wolves in the wild in the US and Mexico in captivity and, and put together kind of our justification of why the service thinks that this is a non-essential designation. Next question is, why are wolves restricted south of I-40? It seems there are more area for them to repopulate north of this boundary. And I will answer that question. Uh, we have a 2017 recovery plan that focuses recovery of the Mexican wolf within the historic range of the species. The majority of this historic range um, occurs from I-40 south down through South Central uh, Mexico. Uh, and everything north of I-40 uh, is sort of an intergradation zone with other, other subspecies. And so with the uh, 10J experimental population uh, being focused on recovery within uh, the exact known historic range, we, that is why uh, we are focusing our, our efforts um, around the I-40 boundary. So next question is, did you say the service could take other actions if issuance of permits to livestock operators are restricted? And what are those? So Tracy, you wanna take that? Sure, and yes, I, I did say that. So during years where these two specific types of permits to livestock operators on federal and non-federal land could be restricted. The service and our partners would still manage wolf livestock conflicts. And so the service could um, take any number of management actions to help reduce the likelihood of depredations or deal with depredating wolves, including um, hazing, harassing and even removing wolves in those cases. And I'll just look at John really quickly to see if he would like to add anything. Nope, okay. Okay, next question is, how much opposition to Mexican wolf reintroduction and recovery is there in Arizona and New Mexico? And um, it's sort of a, relative question, but I'm gonna pass that to John, who's the field projects coordinator of our program. John? Yeah, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, happy to be here. And um, the opposition to wolf wolves in general, um, as you utilize the landscape more, the closer you get to wolves, the greater the opposition is. So uh, an easy way to think of it as people that utilize the environment, um, be it cattle grazing or, or hunting or those type of activities tend to be more against wolf reintroduction versus uh, folks that are a little further away and, and like the idea of wolves more so being out in the wild. But it's all relative question. So I think that's the best way to answer it overall. Next question is, what is the justification for 320 wolves? Uh, this is a two-part question. 
it says diversity would require twice that number. I guess that's the second part. So what is the justi justification for 320 wolves? Tracy? Sure. And this, this question ties back a little bit to a question that someone asked earlier about what viability is. And so I would maybe start the answer to the question with just saying that viability and, and what is an appropriate number of wolves for a population is determined by various characteristics that are um, specific to every population in the environment that that population exists in. And so the 320 for us came from population modeling that we conducted during the development of the revised recovery plan. And I would invite you to both look at the revised recovery plan, as well as the biological report, which includes that population viability modeling report. Those can be found on our website. And those provide a lot of detail around that number of 320. But essentially, we looked at a lot of data specific to Mexican wolves to determine what characteristics would create a stable, viable population that would have a high likelihood of persistence over time, and specifically about a 90% likelihood that the population would persist over 100 years. And based on all of the number crunching uh, that we did, an average of at least 320 wolves gets us again in the United States to a population that's healthy and robust and could be considered recovered. Next question, will this expand the land in which the wolves can multiply and expand? And so I will answer that question. The 10J revisions that we're making now are mainly focused on um, specific court ordered uh, things that a judge said we had to fix. Um, and that doesn't uh, at this point in time, uh, look at expanding the experimental population area from the 2015 rule. So um, that is not part of the revisions that we are making now. Next question. When you say the 10J was remanded, does that mean the Mexican wolf is no longer protected or do you have to state the number of wolves that make a viable population? So Tracy. Okay, so the 10J being remanded, you should have specified this earlier. So uh, the judge stated that while the Fish and Wildlife Service worked on the remand, the 2015 rule would remain in place. So the Mexican wolf is still listed as an endangered subspecies, and we are still managing the experimental population under the 2015 regulations up until we publish a final rule. When we publish a final rule on July 1st of 2022, then whatever this uh, final rule says will be the new set of regulations that we will manage under. And the second part of that question, uh, do you have to state the number of wolves that make a viable population? Essentially, yes, the judge did say that we needed to relook at how many wolves would be needed in the Mexican wolf experimental population area to contribute to the long term conservation and recovery of the Mexican wolf. Next question is, when will the annual, annual release benchmark um, minimum cumulative number of released wolves surviving to breeding age be available for 2021? Um, Tracy? Sure. Yeah, our intention there is that every spring we will look at how many released wolves from previous years have survived to breeding age breeding age occurring generally in the spring, late winter, early spring. Um, and again, depending on the age of released wolves, if we were to put out yearlings or adults, they would survive for one year until breeding age for uh, cross foster puppies, which is when we take the really young puppies from captivity and put them in wild dens, those puppies need to survive for two years until they reach breeding age. So March of this year, we will determine 
um, whether we have reached that annual benchmark for 2021. Next question is, why is the service proposing only two population of wolves and without the needed connectivity? Uh, Tracy, will you take that one? Yeah, and, and here again, I would point uh, the, the uh, participant who asked this question to the recovery plan because we do address our overall strategy in the recovery plan and we talk about um, why we think that two populations is adequate for the recovery of the Mexican wolf. And we also address this issue of connectivity over the United States-Mexico border. Obviously, we've seen changes in the ability of wolves to potentially disperse across that border with um, the increasing building of the border wall over the last years. And so we did have to look at what impact that could have on the populations in the United States and Mexico in terms of any uh, genetic diversity that would occur um, with connectivity between those populations. And so we estimated what level of connectivity we think um, is going to occur. We evaluated whether that was sufficient, and we also integrated actions related to making sure that we move wolves across the border um, if necessary to, to maintain um, or, or accomplish any um, translocation between the populations that could be needed. Next question. Does the 10J rule address if a wolf enters Texas? So with the 10J rule, um, our eastern border is uh, with the state of New Mexico and Texas. So if a wolf wanders over into Texas, it's very similar to if a wolf wanders north of I-40. If a wolf wanders over into Texas, then it is a fully endangered species and all of the uh, section nine prohibitions of the Endangered Species Act apply. And so with our, our Current border right now of the 10J experimental population, the northern boundary is I-40, eastern boundary is a state line uh, between New Mexico and Texas, the western boundary is the state line between Arizona and California, um, and I guess is Nevada part of that, I think, um, don't know my geography that well. And then the southern boundary is the border with Mexico in both states of Arizona and New Mexico. So. Um, next question is, will there no longer be a cap on the population? Since it was stated the population will, will, be, will hopefully be maintained uh, greater than or equal to 320 individuals. So Tracy? Sure, uh, that is correct. We no longer have an upper limit on, or we are proposing to no longer have a, an upper limit on the population. And so when we state that the objective is to manage for um, an average of at least 320 wolves, that means that you know, the population is going to hover around 320, but it needs to be at least that big. And so it could continue to grow larger than, than 320, and it will need to grow larger than 320 in order to have an average of 320. So no more cap. Next question is, what are some of the restrictions that would be included with an essential population designation? Uh, again, back to Tracy. All right. That's, that's a little bit hard to answer. So what I will say is that if we were to designate the experimental population as essential, it would trigger two parts of the Endangered Species Act uh, that would be incorporated into how we manage the population. And that is that we would need to consider designation of critical habitat, and we would need to consult on federal actions under section 7A2, 7 A2, yeah, 72 of the Endangered Species Act. And so um, there aren't necessarily restrictions that would come from critical habitat or consultation per se, but again, those two processes would, would need to be considered um, and potentially fulfilled in our management. I'm not sure if any of my colleagues want to 
give any other clarity beyond that. I think that's good, Tracy. We'll move on to the next question, and which is, will you try to protect the viability of packs by not culling leading wolves in the pack? Um, and I, this, since this is a removal sort of question, a field sort of question, I'm gonna turn that over to John to answer. Thanks, Brady. Um, I, I think what we look at in terms of, of removing individuals is the depredation history and what animals are involved in that history. So we will consider all the history of the animals within the pack, the status of the animals and the genetics of the animals. And then we make a decision on who to call or how best to limit uh, livestock depredations by removing a wolf or two. So there's no particular X, Y, Z uh, strategy to put in place, but uh, it is one of the considerations. Okay, next question is for clarification, is the plan to have 320 wolves across the U.S. or just in this region? Tracy? The uh, proposal that we have put forward is to have an average of at least equal to or, or greater than 320 wolves in the Mexican wolf experimental population area, which is that area south of Interstate 40. So it is specific to wolves in this region. Next question is the ES, ESA says the Secretary of Agriculture may remove a species from an area if it is causing undue economic hardship. For the livestock producer, at what point is undue economic hardship where the Secretary of Ag can step in? And I'll let Tracy answer that. Okay. And I probably won't be able to give an answer on uh, to to exactly respond to that question as to what point of economic hardship Secretary of Ag can step in. I'm not quite familiar with that, but I will reiterate that looking at the economic consequences of our proposed revisions has, has been a big part of our process. And so specific to this rulemaking process, I would invite you to look at the draft supplemental environmental impact statement, um, particularly chapters three and four, where we assess um, what the what the proposed action um, could result in in the way of economic impacts to livestock producers in the area. Um, yeah, so that's maybe all I can say on this one. Okay, next question. What laws will be put in place to stop unnecessary removal slash hunting? And I'll turn that over to Tracy to you to speak on the revisions of the rule and what we're looking at for limiting removals. Okay, so I don't, um, I don't think that any new laws will be put in place to stop unnecessary removal or hunting. Uh, the, the proposed revisions that we are making, again, relate to uh, take on federal land and non-federal land related to our issuance of livestock permits. And then in relation to the unacceptable impacts to wild ungulates, uh, I would just state that it is the state game and fish agencies and the tribal game and fish agencies that regulate um, or manage ungulate, wild ungulate populations in the states of Arizona and New Mexico and regulate hunting permits um, for ungulates, you know, such as elk. Um, and can anyone offer any other clarifications beyond that? John? John. Yeah, I think there's two different things inherent in that question. The, Removal, obviously, 
uh, within the scope of the 10J removal of wolves, we take very seriously. We consider each one the collective of information and decide whether the removal is necessary based on the history of the livestock and whether or not we've completed uh, the, the pack is not responding to uh, non-lethal, non-removal techniques, i.e. hazing, trying to prevent those livestock depredations from any other way. And then the laws uh, currently prevent, in the 10J rule, the Endangered Species Act, prevent hunting of wolves, for instance. I think that's more of the framework they were coming oh. with. Oh, okay. Thanks, Just John. I read it wrong. Okay, thanks, Tracy. Thanks, John. The next question is, does the border wall restrict wolf recovery? And so I will take that question. Um, at this time, I, our population uh, has not really risen to a level where we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, wolves trying to go back and forth either from Mexico up to here or from here down to Mexico. We have had several wolves in Mexico over the last, I don't know, five to eight years or so uh, that have wandered up into the U.S. Uh, have a handful of wolves that um, some of those turn around and went back south uh, to Mexico. Others were um, unfortunately killed on highways or, uh, but none have really come up far enough to interact with the U.S. population. We did have one wolf recently uh, here in the U.S. Uh, that uh, tried to go down to Mexico from U.S. Uh, it did hit the border and skirt the border for a ways and then came back up into the U.S. But at this time, um, I would say that right now we're not uh, seeing uh, that big of a population in the wild um, and really uh, other than that, uh, one instance, uh, too many hindrances of, uh, but really the populations aren't uh, uh, connecting, making any sort of a connection just yet. But, but we do have a number of cases where uh, the wolves are starting to go south as well as come north. So, and and uh, some of those are successfully crossing the border. And so I was gonna open it up uh, to see if there's any folks uh, on the phone who have questions, if so. Um, I think uh, there's maybe Rick or Dave. Yeah, can... Brady, this is Rick with DJ Case. So if, for our phone attendees, if you do have a question, press star nine to raise your hand and we'll try to pick you up and, uh, and unmute you so you can ask, ask a question. Star nine to raise a hand. And we do have a few more minutes. Um, we want to be. We're going to wrap up here by by uh, six forty five. Um, uh, so if there, if you have additional questions to put in the the Q and A um, for those of you that are on online, then then jump in there and and add those. Since we're not hearing any on the phone, I see another question. Um, the question is: Would the U.S. consider releasing adult wolves into the wild? that have genetics that are otherwise not represented? Uh, or would the revision continue to consider cross fostering of puppies only? And I will answer that question. So at this time, we are mainly focusing on uh, getting genetics from the captive population into the wild through cross fostering. One of the main reasons that um, we are focusing on cr cross fostering rather than releasing adult wolves is that um, when we are cross fostering the puppies uh, so far, the, uh, it seems to be very successful. The wild uh, uh, parents are accepting those puppies. They're raising them to be wild. They're teaching them how to be wild. And so the puppies are growing up um, to be wild wolves. And as part of that, there are less issues and less problems associated with uh, either human wolf interactions or livestock interactions. And so whenever you take a captive wolf that was raised in captivity uh, to adulthood and then put it out into the wild, uh, that wolf has 
learn some level of um, human acceptance. Uh, and so putting uh, that type of wolf out into the wild from captivity, they tend to wind up um, being less scared of people and causing more problems on the landscape. Um, and so we are focusing most of our efforts on, on right now on cross fostering uh, because we are able to do it at a level and a number that we will reach our recovery goals, um, genetic goals doing it that way, uh, as well as uh, those puppies, like I said, uh, being raised by wild wolves and teaching them how to be wild. So next question is, specify that, oh, but, that the, I'm sorry, did you have something, Tracy? I did real quick. I just wanted okay. to kind of clarify that the rule does continue to allow for the release of adult wolves, which could be pairs or packs, as well as um, puppies, such as the cross foster animals that Brady is talking about. So the rules allow us some flexibility and it is our choice right now to be focusing on this cross fostering strategy for the reasons that Brady articulated. So right, I just wanted to you, make sure that people knew that the rule doesn't say anything about only doing cross fosters. Okay, thanks for that clarification and that explanation, Tracy, because that does, you know, we do have the options um, to be able to, and more management flexibility with the rule, but right now our, our focus is, is, is on cross fostering and, and that's kind of why. So next, then thanks for clarifying, Tracy. Next question is specify that the rule allows for adult wolves too, though. Okay, um, sorry, that wasn't a question that was Tracy clarifying that, so sorry. Next question is, where is the Kaibab National Forest, or where in the Kaibab National Forest was Anubis or Mel 2520 shot? Um, so I'll answer this question. Uh, the, uh, on January the 2nd, we learned that uh, Mel 2520 was killed. He was north of I-40. It is under law enforcement investigation. And so there's not uh, anything further that we're gonna be able to uh, explain or provide on that. So, um, so next question is, does this 10J area have rules specifying that we would capture and return any individuals from the experimental population that move outside of the boundary? And so I will answer that within a 10J rule. Uh, the Endangered Species Act says you have to draw a line on the map showing where that the rules or the reduced regulations apply. And those rules only apply within the boundary of that 10J rule. So anything outside of the boundary of the 10J, any revisions or any regulations set forth in the 10J do not apply outside of the 10J. Next question is, what is the current genetic status of the captive population in terms of inbreeding coefficients? And why does the Fish and Wildlife Service feel inbreeding depression threats will be alleviated over the 100 years analyzed by the PVA once the captive and wild populations are genetically homogenized? Maggie, would you answer that? Yeah, let me see. I'm going to have to digest that a little bit. Let's see. The current genetic status of the captive population in terms of inbreeding coefficients is uh, the mean inbreeding of the captive population is just less than 0 0.15, <laughs> if that's what the question is getting at. Um, and then in terms of um, addressing potential genetic threats to the population and what we did in the PVA, you know, we established a goal of achieving 90% of the gene diversity that's in captivity represented in the wild. Um, and so that's, that's, that's the goal that was used to kind of uh, address the inputs in the PVA. And still, as we get to recovery and delisting, we would need to show that the wild pop that the threats, genetic threats to the wild population have been alleviated, even if we have met that 90% of gene diversity represented in the wild. Um, since I'm not entirely sure that that's what the question is getting at. I'll, I'll look to my colleagues, maybe add more information, but um, that's how I read it. I'm not getting a head nods up, so I'll turn it back to you, Brady. Okay, thanks, Maggie. Next question, once the genetic recovery objective is met and the restrictions on take are 
are lifted, how will the service ensure that the resume takes do not decrease the Mexican gray wolf's genetic diversity? Um, I think I'll let Tracy answer that one. Okay, thanks Brady. Um, so as we release more wolves from captivity and they integrate into the population, those that survive and then a subset of those that breed, then the gene diversity in the wild population will improve. And it it's, seems kind of uncomfortable or counterintuitive, but actually kind of the more released wolves we put out, the less different they are, again, because the gene diversity is improving in the wild. So that's why we are proposing to lift the restrictions once we've met the genetic objective, because at that point, we will have improved the gene diversity of the, of the wild population. And at that point, I think it goes back to what John mentioned earlier, that anytime we do a removal action, and, and um, certainly at that point in the future when the restrictions have been lifted, when we do any removals or management actions, we will take into account any of the necessary characteristics we need to consider about the wolves that, um, that are, you know, going to be potentially taken. So the, um, the genetics of that wolf would be taken into account. So I, I think that our general management at that point um, would be to ensure that the genetic gains that we have accomplished don't go away because we will be looking to be close to recovering the Mexican wolf and wanting to maintain those goals and objectives that we have set. Okay, next question is, I have read that there have been several cases of collared wolves shot and killed by people who had access to real-time telemetry data. If this is so, what is the service doing to limit such access to those who truly need to have it? And I'm going to turn that over to John Oakleaf, the field projects coordinator. I guess the first part of that question is I'm not familiar that several people who have access to real-time telemetry data have shot and killed wolves. I don't think that's the case. And so I'm not really familiar with that. But we do provide receivers to... Uh, ranchers, and that's the only real-time real telemetry data that's out there. And um, those do not have frequencies associated with them. They do have program numbers. And the reason for doing that is to help in our common goal, which is to prevent livestock depredations. And that way you don't remove wolves. And so that's a goal of, of all constitu constituents out there. Um, and that's what we've done as a program, and that's what we intend to continue to do. If we do have evidence from law enforcement that they're being misused, then, um, and, and we consistently ask this question to law enforcement, then we would consider revising how those receivers are giving out, given out overall. But right now, they're a good tool for our collective goal, all of our goal to reduce livestock depredations and reduce removals of wolves. Next question is, I still don't understand how you define a wolf population as essential versus non-essential. Tracy, you wanna provide further explanation? Okay, sure. Uh, so Section 10J of the Endangered Species Act requires that we determine whether a population is um, the wording of the Endangered Species Act is essential to the continued survival or essential to the continued existence of a species. So we basically ask ourselves that question, is this experimental population essential to the continued existence of the species? And um, then we have looked at, again, the status of the population in the United States, in Mexico, in captivity, 
to be able to kind of work through that question as to whether or not the Mexican wolf experimental population area wolves are essential to the continued existence of the Mexican wolf. Okay, thanks, Tracy. Next question. I understand the revision will provide take and response for unaccept unacceptable impacts to ungulates. Can you please help to elaborate upon the scientific peer reviewed process and what factors impact such an authorization? Uh, there's also a second part, but I'll stop there and let Tracy answer this first part. Okay. I, I think what the person asking the question is um, talking about is in the 2015 10J rule where we established the take provision for take in response to unacceptable impacts. Um, to a wild ungulate herd, we specify a process where the state could request to the service to remove wolves and that that information would need to be peer reviewed as part of the deliberation process um, and the information that the service would receive to then decide whether or not to issue that take. And so I will just clarify that we are not revising anything about that peer review process in our current proposed revisions, we're only proposing to revise at what point that type of take could start. So I think if you want to kind of see the exact wording around peer review, then your best bet is to look at the 2015 10J rule under the allowable forms of take um, and kind of read the specific verbiage around the peer review process that's there. Okay, the second part of that question is, will additional measures be added to prevent ungulate conflict through non-lethal resolutions? And so, Tracy? We do not currently, we have not provoked, uh, what do I wanna say, proposed <laughs> any additional measures in the Tenji rule at this time. Certainly if people have ideas about that, that they want to submit in the public comment period, we would be very, interested in reviewing them. Um, is there anything else? I'm looking at my colleagues to see if there's anything else to add here to this question. Um, ungulate conflict, because um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking we're still talking about wild ungulates, but I think I'm a little unclear on the question. So I wonder if the person who wrote it maybe could clarify with another question. If we're talking about wild ungulates now or back to livestock. Yeah, I, I assume it's wild ungulates, but it, let's for in, take a moment and assume if it is livestock, um, there we still have management flexibility in the role to um, remove wolves through other means and mechanisms, uh, including non-lethal, to help pre prevent further livestock situations or uh, whatever it is that is occurring in the landscape to help resolve some of those issues. Um, and so I think we have maybe one more minute and I see one more question. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and ask, um, throw the, this question out there. Has there been a consideration for requiring proactive measures by the livestock producer before the service issues a take by either the producer or the management team? Um, and so I'll let Tracy answer this. That suggestion was raised in the public scoping comments that we received in the spring of 2020 um, when we went out to the public for public scoping about this proposed revision. Uh, so we do have just a little bit of discussion of that in the draft supplemental environmental impact statement in chapter two, kind of surrounding the idea that we, we um, wanted to put forward revisions that still allow for various types of management flexibility. And so requiring something proactive um, doesn't really give us that flexibility. And um, so, so was it considered? Yes. Have we moved forward with anything to require proactive measures? No, but there are proactive, um, there's funding available for conflict avoidance measures uh, and certainly the service and our partners continue to work with 
with uh, producers to try to implement proactive measures. And we are big supporters of proactive measures that can prevent conflict in the first place. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Brady. Uh, yeah, wonderful questions and, and uh, insightful questions and, and, and great answers. I, I, I feel bad having to, to cut off the discussion, but it, um, we do want to um, have, make sure we have as much time as we, we can for comments tonight. Um, if you're unable to, to answer your question, um, we invite you to, to visit the Mexican Wolf website. As we mentioned there, you, you can find a, a few frequently asked questions there, as well as the recordings of the previous information sessions. Um, where a number of these types of questions were answered already. Um, we also wanted to give you a heads, up, a heads up that we had lots of folks registered to give comment tonight, uh, and we'd like to give as many people a chance to speak as possible. So to, to accommodate as many speakers as we can, we'll be limiting comments to two minutes per person, um, we'll, and we'll have a little timer to help, help uh, move that along. Our apologies in advance, but we want to, again, as allow as many people a chance to speak tonight as we can. Obviously, if you have additional comments that you can't cover uh, um, beyond the, in two minutes, um, we would invite, invite you to submit those, those in writing. So with that, let's take a 15 minute break and be back here at 7 p.m. Mountain Time to begin the hearing. Uh, at that time, I'll provide instructions for submitting comments uh, again when we re reconvene. We'll leave the Zoom uh, meeting here open during the break, so please feel free to stay connected. Uh, while we're on bake, uh, break, we'll project the names of the first five people. Uh, you see them there um, that we have on the list. And so we're just going to go, I'm going to go down through the list and call on, on each person as we, we, we go. Um, uh, and uh, we'll also uh, give instructions for those that are on, on the phone. So let's go ahead and take a break and we'll reconvene at, at seven o'clock mountain time uh, sharp. Thanks. Okay, let's get started. On behalf of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, I'd like to welcome you back to tonight's public comment hearing. For those, those of you who are just joining now, uh, the question and answer session ended at 645. Uh, we'll now turn our full attention to the formal, uh, to your formal testimony. Uh, my name is, again is Dave Case uh, with DJ Case and Associates, a contractor uh, hired to help the Fish and Wildlife Service coordinate and, and moderate tonight's uh, meeting. A reminder that there are several ways to you can comment. Uh, first, you may submit comments online at regulations.gov uh, comment portal. Uh, second, you can uh, mail your uh, written comments to the service as Tracy indicated earlier. Uh, I'm not going to restate those addresses now since Tracy mentioned them earlier, but I'll leave them on the screen for a few moments for those of you online and remind everyone that they are listed on the website. And finally, the third way you can comment, and the main reason we're here tonight is, is uh, by delivering your comments verbally through this Zoom portal or, or over the phone. Uh, we are recording this session uh, to capture and transcribe those comments, and I'll cover that process, the cover the process will follow uh, shortly. 
Um, please note, uh, important to note that all comments are treated equally. It doesn't matter which way you choose to submit your comment. They're all, they will all be read by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They all will be treated the same and they, will, uh, they all will uh, become part of the public record. Uh, the key thing to remember is that uh, this part of the evening is for the service to listen to your comments. At, at this point, we are no longer answering questions um, about the proposed revisions, other than if you have a, a simple kind of clarifying process question. Uh, if you have questions beyond what we covered earlier in the Q&A session, uh, you, uh, please reach out to the service staff uh, after, after this event. We have a large number of people who registered to speak tonight, so in order to keep the process fair and allow everyone a chance to, to comment equally, we'll give each person two minutes to speak. Uh, everyone will be muted until uh, called on to speak. Uh, if you registered for this event, you had the chance to indicate if you wanted to speak this evening. Um, we have listed those individuals by name in, in the order that you registered, and we'll read those names as a way to keep the process moving right along uh, and display them on the screen in groups of 10 or so, um, so you know when your turn is coming. When it's your turn, uh, we'll, call, we'll call your name. If you're online, uh, you'll receive a notification on your screen um, uh, that, uh, that you are being asked to unmute, and you must accept that invitation. In other words, we've got you all muted you'll receive an invitation that says um, uh, you've been asked to unmute. Be, be sure to click that so that we, we can hear what, what you're saying. Um, then we'll ask you to unmute your microphone using the mic controls at the bottom. Uh, you can find that control at the bottom of the Zoom tool, toolbar, bottom, bottom left. If you are joining us by phone, uh, we'll call your name uh, and authorize you to unmute. You will then press star six to unmute and you'll be, you'll be uh, ready to go. If we cannot identify you from the phone number you are calling on, we may need to ask you to, to raise your hand by pressing uh, star nine on your phone keypad. This will show us uh, which number is you so we can authorize you to unmute. I, I know this is a lot of details and it would be a lot easier if we were all in a big room together, um, but we'll repeat the directions as needed uh, as we go. And I'm confident we can, we can get, get, uh, get through this together. Regardless of how you're joining us, uh, when you're unmuted and ready to speak, please state your name um, and, and spell your name for us. Um, and tell us if you're representing an organization, um, tell us what that organization is and then, then give us your comments. Uh, again, just want to re reiterate to state your full name and, and spell it so that we get it correct in the record. And I do apologize in advance um, if uh, I'm going to call you out by name so that we're, we have a record of, 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 of how it went. Uh, and I apologize if I mispronounce uh, your, your name, um, but we want to make sure we hear it from you and then also uh, the spelling. There will be an on-screen timer so you know how much time you have left. If you're on the phone, uh, you'll have to manage your own time and I'll let you know when uh, there are 30 seconds left in the, in the two minutes. When you're finished up your two minutes, we'll mute the microphone again so we can move on to the, to the next person. We'll continue this process until everyone um, we have registered to speak has had an opportunity or until um, uh, it gets to the, the 9, 9.30. Um, as we mentioned, we'll, we'll expand that to, a, to 9.30 if, if needed. Uh, when, you're, when it's your turn to speak, uh, if someone has uh, already covered your comment, um, it's perfectly fine to, to pass if you feel like it's already been covered uh, and we'll go to the next lane, name on the list. Uh, please do not use profanity or inappropriate language. Uh, we welcome passion in your comments, but we need to keep the, re the recording and the transcript G rated. So we reserve the right to mute your microphone if, if needed. Um, stay tuned for instructions. Um, uh, if, if we have time um, after the two hour session, um, uh, we'll, we'll ask if, if, if there are additional comments. Um, and so, so we'll stay tuned for those instructions. If you weren't planning to, if you didn't register, but would like to change your mind and like to give a comment, we, we may have some time for that, but we, we won't know until we get there. Again, in order to keep the process fair for everyone, we need to hold firm to the two minute rule. There'll be an on screen timer um, that you'll see uh, if you're online. And for those on the phone, again, I just reemphasize that I'll give you the 30 second warning. Um, if it's nothing personal, um, we just want to make sure that everyone has a chance to speak. Uh, so we may, we'll, we'll, we may need to mute you and move on to the next, next person. Uh, the hearing will run till 9 p.m. Mountain Time as, as we mentioned. Um, and uh, remember, you can always submit your comments by mail or through the regulations.gov online portal. So with that, um, we'll pull up the list of the first uh, 10 speakers who are on the list. 
Uh, I will read the, the list of speakers uh, after every five or so commented. So those that are joining us by phone know when their name is approaching. Um, we'll move through this fairly quickly. Um, so we'll now un un unmute uh, the, the, first, the first person. So for our folks on the phone, the, the list of speakers on the, on the screen at the moment, we have Polly Walker, Rachel, and excuse me if I butcher a name, uh, Rachel Rakaski, Aaron Hunt, Christopher Smith, Megan Ottman, Jeffrey Sine, Sane, uh, R.W. Marzula, Mary Catherine Ray, Mary Barron, and Allison Dahlman. Those are the folks in our first group of 10. Uh, with that, I'm looking for Polly, and I'm sorry that I don't see Polly at the moment. Um, so Polly, if you happen to be on the phone in a phone number that we can't identify, if you could hit star nine to raise your hand and identify your line. line. And I don't see any hands going up there. Uh, I'm also looking for Rachel. Uh, that was Rachel Rakaski. Uh, Rachel, if you're out there on a, on a phone line, if you could also raise your hand, star nine to, to raise your hand on the phone. I'm not seeing Rachel either. I believe that Aaron, uh, as our third speaker, is out there. So Aaron, I'll uh, allow you to talk here. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Erin Hunt, E-R-I-N-H-U-N-T, and I'm speaking as an individual, though my comment will echo the thoughts of many who care about the future of Mexican gray wolves. The 10-J rule must provide a realistic, measurable way to achieve Mexican wolf recovery. While I've long admired the efforts of all the staff at the Mexican Wolf Recovery Program, this rule cannot be effort-based. Objectives must be measurable, or we have no way of knowing when threats have been addressed, and we can celebrate meaningful recovery. The 10-J rule should designate Mexican wolves as essential. Losing our existing population would jeopardize recovery. The Mexican wolf SSP lacks the capacity to replace the nearly 200 wolves in the wild within a meaningful time frame to prevent significant loss of gene diversity. Losing the generations of experience that our wild packs have would be a substantial setback for recovery. The rule should provide freedom from arbitrary and unscientific boundaries ensuring Mexican wolves can expand into new territory, including the Grand Canyon ecoregion and Southern Rockies, especially as climate change impacts their historic range. The population objective should achieve a widely distributed meta population of at least 750 Mexican wolves. An average of 320 is far too low to ensure a resilient wild population. The proposed rule still artificially limits wolves' ability to seek new habitats and expand throughout their historic range and doesn't do enough to ensure connectivity between populations in the US and Mexico. You should measure, not just model, the genetic diversity and inbreeding of the wild population and act quickly to prevent further loss of gene diversity. Unless cross-fostered wolves reproduce, they're not contributing their genes to the wild population. Wolves should count towards a genetic objective only after they've reproduced it in the wild. You should consider the reality that limited breeding in the SSP may result in a smaller number of litters to choose from. You should support the release of well-bonded wolf families into the wild to immediately impact gene diversity. You should include firm requirements to prevent conflicts with livestock and increase capacity to conduct community outreach and support communities. I see how hard you and your colleagues have worked to achieve the progress, but this isn't the time to stop or be timid. Be bold and create a 10-J rule that's visionary in what it can achieve for the long-term conservation of Mexican wolves. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Christopher Smith, Rick, jump in here and help it as you see them. I am looking for uh, Chris Smith and don't see them either. Uh, so if again, if you're on the phone, Christopher, if you could please star nine to raise your hand. Not seeing Christopher. Okay, uh, Megan Oltman. Again, not seeing Megan. Megan, if you're out on the phone lines, if you could star nine, please. And Jeffrey saying it looks, I believe you're there, Jeffrey. I saw that you great. Can you hear me? Sure can. All right. Thank you. My name is thank you for the opportunity to talk. Um, 
My name is Jeffrey Sign, G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y. And you got the pronunciation right the first time. It's Sign, S-A-I-G-N. I don't want to repeat everything that Aaron said. I agree with all of that. My main concern is the genetic pool is way too small to be looking at this population of wolves as uh, a model or a success story at this time uh, because of the unpredictability of climate change and so many other factors. The population has to be several thousand really before you look at genetic pool numbers to be uh, taken into account any kind of variabilities in climate and prey species, et cetera. So I recommend strongly that you do everything that you can to keep rebuilding this population, letting it expand and uh, use as much, uh, as many non-lethal measures as possible when there's any conflict with uh, cattle industry and wi uh, other wildlife. Uh, that's it, thank you very much. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, R.W. Marzullo. Not seeing RW. So again, if you could start nine, if you're on a phone line. Okay. And uh, if we, if we go too fast, we'll come back and pick you up if you star star nine. Uh, Mary Catherine Ray. Not seeing Mary in our list of participants either. Again, star nine. If you're on the phone, please. Okay. I see a hand raised there. Thank you. Go ahead. And then you'll have to star six to unmute. There you go. Um, can you all hear me? My name's Mary Catherine Ray. Hi, Mary Catherine. We can hear you. Wonderful. That's spelled M-A-R-Y-K-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E-R-A-Y. I'm the volunteer wildlife chair for the Rio Grande chapter of the Sierra Club. And also for 30 years, I've lived in a remote part of Socorro County and have been awed to see wolves near our home please consider these points. One, if something happened to extirpate the wild wolf population, captive wolves could not restore it for many years. The evolutionary selection of wolves in the wild today might not be replaceable at all. Recovery takes place in the wild. The single wild population in the United States meets the legal definition of essential under the Endangered Species Act, and it should be so designated. Two, because of our warming climate, in the coming decades, wildlife will need to be able to move north as southern areas potentially become unsuitable. Species of migratory bird are already doing this. The restriction on wolf movement beyond the arbitrary northern boundary of I-40 should be abandoned. And three, artificially suppressing the population to an average of 320 wolves is too small, according to the best available science. Wolves regulate their own numbers and are themselves excellent wildlife managers. They preferentially choose to prey on the injured and infirm, thus keeping herds healthy. The ability of wolves to mitigate the growing threat of chronic wasting disease and other zoonoses in deer and elk should not be thwarted by unnaturally minimizing their numbers. Not sufficiently addressing these issues will invite more litigation. The cycle of lawsuits harms the credibility of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the delay is also harming the potential for Lobo success. Thank you for considering these comments. Thank you, Mary Catherine. Um, next is Mary Barron. Looking for Mary in our list as well. Mary, if you happen to be on the phone line and have, if you could star nine to raise your hand. And then next is Allison Dahlman. Allison raised her hand, okay. Hi, I'm Dr. Allison Dahlman, A-L-L-Y-S-O-N, D-A-L-L-M-A-N-N, -L -L -N, not part of an organization. Per the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's rules and regulations, when states alter laws that significantly increase the threat to wolf populations, as has already occurred in several states, we may use the emergency relisting under section 4B7 with states goaling to kill up to 90% of wolf, gray wolves and only 186 Mexican wolves as of the end of 2020. What are you waiting for? Your mission statement is to conserve and protect wildlife, but you are allowing our essential wolves to be slaughtered in refusing to relist and redesignate. 
No wolf is experimental or non-essential. They are all endangered, essential victims of myths and ignorance. Because there are so few and the service has not utilized measurable genetic standards to protect their genetic variability, more bonded families must be released into the wild if they're to survive. Cross-fostered wolves would need to reproduce in the wild before their genes would even count towards any genetic objective. Counting these wolves as part of the 320 is misleading and inaccurate. Releases into the ecosystem, the Grand Canyon ecosystem and Southern Rockies would improve resiliency and benefit the ecosystem as wolves are keystone species benefiting many plant and animal species. Please review the trophic cascade. All species depend on genetic diversity to survive. Scientists and geneticists recommended 750 to 1,000, not a paltry 320. Please review the three R's of recovery, redundancy, resiliency, and representation. You used it in the past and you needed to apply it to Mexican wolves. Mexican wolves are still functionally extinct in the vast majority of places they used to live, which included areas north of I-40, a human political boundary which fails the criteria for adequate representation. As a veterinarian, I know that capturing and translocating wolves is dangerous and traumatizing for them, and they need to travel north of I-40 to connect with other wolves. Connectivity increases genetic diversity. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Next is Lydia James. Looking for Lydia online as well and not seeing, uh, seeing Lydia. Again, if you're on a phone number, that's uh, just, a, just a number. If this is you, Lydia, if you could hit star nine, please. Okay. Let's move on then, uh, Carrie Romero. I don't see a Carrie Romero, but I do see a different Romero. Uh, Carrie, if that's you, uh, could you raise your hand to con confirm? Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Sandy Barr is next on the list. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm Sandy Barr. It's S A N D Y B A H R, and I'm the chapter director for Sierra Club's Grand Canyon chapter, which is the Arizona chapter. The ivory billed woodpecker, the green blossom pearly mussel, the large kawaii thrush, and little Mariana fruit bat are among a list of 22 species declared extinct by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in 2021. The Mexican gray wolf was not among these extinct species, due in large part to the Endangered Species Act, biologists, and advocates. They're not on that list because the best science was used to develop a captive breeding program and through advocacy and yes, some litigation, the wolves were finally released into the wild to do what wolves do, mate, form packs, kill prey. The wolves continue to do their part, but we must do much better at doing ours. And that means we must absolutely use the best science going forward. The proposed rule you have drafted falls short on that. Sierra Club has long supported the recovery of Mexican wolves and their full protection under the ESA. That's why we're asking you to change the designation of these animals from non-essential to essential. The non-essential status was never appropriate. It's clear it doesn't give the wolves the protection they need to thrive. Follow the science and make them essential. Eliminate the population cap. Remove or at least revise the northern boundary to allow wolves like Anubis to establish in that area. Require at least 750 to 1,000 Mexican wolves in several populations, not the two populations in the rule. Connected populations are needed to maximize genetic diversity in the wild. I care deeply about Mexican wolves and what I hope will be a real recovery, a strong, self-sustaining, ecologically effective population. But I do not ask you to make changes based on the fact that I care. I ask you to make these changes based on the science and the mandate you have under the Endangered Species Act. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Next up is Jean Sario. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Jean. Uh, 
My name is Jean Osorio, that's spelled J-E-A-N, last name O-S-S-O-R-I-O. -O. I've been active on behalf of Mexican gray wolves since before the first wolf paws hit the ground in Arizona. Um, I've been going out often with my husband, sometimes by myself, sometimes with other women, uh, once in a while showing somebody from out of, out of the state around. And I saw my first wolf in 1999 in the wild. It was Hawk's Nest AM 131. The following year, I watched seven of the Franciscos romping in the snow at Double Cienega in Arizona. I attended my first NEPA hearing in the year 2000 in reserve. It was an EA for the translocation of wolves into New Mexico. Before they, that, they couldn't even be translocated into the state. And it was a, a NEPA process for that. I've gone to many of them since. I've spent 551 nights camping in wolf home ranges. I've seen 57 in the wild. All of this doesn't make me any kind of great expert, but I do know that those of you who are working on the project. I've met many of you in your natural habitat in the field. Uh, and I know that you care deeply about the wolves and want this project to succeed. Please think about the fact that for some of you, this has been essentially your entire professional life. I've known some of you since you showed up here in 2001 and, and around that time. So this means a lot to you. It means a lot to me. Please pay attention to the things the scientists are saying. And also we will be submitting, Peter and I, extensive written comments in which we will give you all the details that we're concerned about. Thank you very much for this opportunity to comment. Thank you, Jean. Next is Maggie Howell. Hi. Uh, my name is Maggie Howell, M-A-G-G-I-E-H-O-W-E-L-L. -L. I'm the director of the Wolf Conservation Center, a nonprofit environmental education organization, and also a participant in the Mexican Wolf Species Survival Plan. And I really appreciate the opportunity to comment and for all of you here tonight. Uh, for 40 years, the Mexican Wolf SSP has played a critical role in preventing the extinction of the Mexican wolf through carefully managed captive breeding research and providing the wolves for reintroduction. For 20 years, it's been an honor for us to contribute to this effort as well. To house, care, and support these wolves is a commitment we've eagerly accepted. We also embrace our role as conduits. We connect our local community to Mexican wolves via education, outreach. We're also bringing the Lobo to a global audience via our robust network of live webcams, distance learning programming, and social media platforms, connecting several millions of people to Lobos, their importance, their plight, and the great efforts our nation has taken to recover them. We care deeply about Lobo recovery, but we find the proposed management rule fails to reflect our level of commitment and the level of commitment required to reestablish a viable, genetically diverse, self-sustaining population. The proposed rule fails the science test and ultimately the Lobo. Mexican wolves need full protection under the ESA with a designation of essential. It should not be assumed that the SSP should be able to provide nearly 200 adequate wolves for release in short order. Moreover, it would immediately further degrade the genetic health of the remaining population. And with an effort unlikely to be politically palatable, it's questionable if the service would attempt such an effort at all. Given the severity of the Lobo's genetic crisis, wolves need an essential designation. Instead of measuring genetic health by flawed non-informative metrics, the rule also needs to include measurable standards for assuring progress toward recovery benchmarks based on the best available science. It should include an effective migration rate to protect against genetic decline. It must also do more to limit human-caused mortality, including illegal killings, eliminate artificial boundaries that prevent dispersal to suitable habitat, and restrict lethal control to cases in which wolves pose a likely threat to human health or safety. And naturally, the new rule must be based on the best available science. Thanks to the ESA and the collaboration between the service and varied stakeholder groups, we gave the Lobo a second chance. And with second chances so hard to come by, we shouldn't be willing to throw it away now. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Next, uh, Maria Komentowski. 
I don't see Maria uh, in our list of participants. Maria, if you're on the phone, if you could please hit star nine. Okay. Uh, next is Jean uh, or Jeannie Trupiano. Hello, this is Jean. Hi, Jean. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Jean Trupiano, J E A N N E T R U P I A N O. I'm the president of the board for the Grand Canyon Wolf Recovery Project, headquartered in Flagstaff, Arizona. We, along with our partners, are dedicated to bringing back wolves to help restore the ecological health of the Grand Canyon region. I really appreciate this opportunity to give comments tonight for my board of directors. I would like to first off express my disappointment with the service for its lack of responsiveness to clear direction given by the court order. I realize the service has a difficult task to thread the needle between scientific evidence and external pressures from those who use the historic range of the Mexican gray wolf for consumptive purposes. But because of this failing, the service has presented us with a proposed rule and draft supplemental EIS that lacks bold action to successfully provide for the recovery of the only population of Mexican gray wolves in the United States. Further, I believe the service is lacking in its duty to fully realize the purpose and the intent of the Endangered Species Act, the ESA as intended by Congress. As stated in the court order, Judge Zips expressly quotes that the goal of the ESA is to halt and reverse the trend towards species extinction, whatever the cost, and that the goal of species recovery is to establish a population that is self-sustaining without human interference. I would like to uh, reiterate three key areas that have been brought up tonight that of the uh, feeling of the, the research being used for genetic health the designation of essentiality and the project boundary. I really feel that, especially with the project boundary, that unless the entire historic range of the Mexican gray wolf is, is open to these animals, the health and viability, viability of this unique species will not be able to reach full recovery. Um, so in conclusion, I just, you know, applaud you for your work, but please be reminded that our goal is to bring this species into a viable population um, that will go to delisting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean. Next is Don, Donna Ritter. Still looking for Donna. Again, Donna, if you happen to be on a phone line, if you could please hit star nine. Okay, uh, Donna doesn't isn't there. Uh, Michael Robinson. Michael Hi, my name is Michael Robinson. M I C H A E L R O B I N S O N. I represent the Center for Biological Diversity. We're a nonprofit conservation organization that has been working to save the Mexican wolf, including through suing the US Fish and Wildlife Service to compel reintroduction of the Mexican wolf as early as 1990. And we've continued uh, to try and uh, steer the Fish and Wildlife Service toward actual conservation and recovery of the Mexican wolf, including uh, through the litigation that led to the current rulemaking. The Fish and Wildlife Service is still on the wrong track and we will be submitting extensive written comments, but an outline of some of the corrections that need to be made are as followed. First of all, you're doing right in eliminating the cap on wolf numbers. Uh, there was no biological basis for that. It's likely to pose additional long-term genetic uh, uh, burdens on the Mexican wolf population, and the number of wolves should be allowed to increase. Um, there should not be any kind of informal or vaguely stated uh, average goal that is the equivalent of a cap. Uh, wolves should be allowed to continue to recover until such time as they actually qualify for delisting uh, under the Endangered Species Act. And that will not be under the spurious and unscientific standards that are in the recovery plan. Uh, we support not removing wolves in response to their predation on native ungulates as proposed, but that uh, removal of take authority 
granted to the state should not be time limited as proposed, but instead should be permanent. Again, there's no biological basis for it. The other propo proposed provisions limiting wolf killings and wolf removals are entirely insufficient to conserve genetic diversity. Contrary to the proposed rule, it is important that this population should be designated as essential. Wolves should be allowed to roam outside of the experimental population area. The commitment by the Fish and Wildlife Service to remove wolves outside the boundary hinders recovery and should be nixed. Family packs should be released from captivity to the wild to enhance genetic diversity. Releases of captive born wolves into the dens of unrelated to wolves to the wild is not making enough of a difference. And I will reserve the rest of my comments uh, of, for the Center for Biological Diversity for our, uh, for our written submission. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, next up is David Hartley. Go ahead, David. Yeah, uh, can you hear me now? I sure can. All right, my name is David Hartley, uh, D-A-V-A-D-H-A-R-T-L-E-Y. I'm a longtime resident of Flagstaff, Arizona. My major concern tonight is the I-40 corridor, which I'm very familiar with. I spend a considerable amount of time in the back country of Northern Arizona. I am acquainted with almost all accesses on the I-40 corridor between the Northern and Southern junctures. I do know for a fact that wolves cross between those two, the, that corridor from the South to the North. And I do know that, I've seen their tracks, I've seen them physically and heard them, both collared and uncollared. And I was acquainted with Anubis as well. And this is, uh, sorry, this is, um, I, I, I knew that wolf. And um, so it's a little hard to not be emotional tonight, but this is on his behalf um, that this corridor be opened up to all Mexican wolves in the north and they can come here to the Flagstaff area and other Northern Arizona areas and be fully protected and granted a right to come back to their home in the Flagstaff area and other Northern areas and Grand Canyon as well. And so I'm asking you to do that, to open that up to them, because it already happens. I know for a fact, and it happens in several areas. So it's undisputed. And so it needs to be opened up. There's no reason that there should be a block there because if the wolves don't cross under, which they mostly do, they'll cross over and get ran over. So um, I'm asking that. Thank you very much for all your work. I'm also asking that the cap of 325 wolves be removed and 1,000 wolves or more be allowed to be played into that scenario. Please open up the Northern Corridor because it already happens, wolves cross back and forth. As I said, some collared and some not collared. So um, thank you for all your efforts for this really amazing program tonight so we could talk live in Zoom and I'm grateful and I love the Mexican wolf and this is for you Anubis, thank you. Thank you, David. Next is, is Gary Rose. Still searching for Gary. Um, okay. if, you're on, if you're online, can you hit star nine if you happen to be on a phone line? Okay, uh, Trish Marie. Looking for Trish as well. Trish, if you're on a phone line, please hit star nine. And Peter Osario. Go ahead. Hello. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep, My name is one. Peter Osorio. B E T E R O S S O R I O. Earlier, I leveled with you about the two most likely reasons that you'll litigate and lose because the new rule is shackled to the recovery plan, the service must convince the court the recovery plan based on data at least five years old is the best available science. And also, as has been commented by at least two of the peer reviewers, that instead of effective migrants, the proposed genetic objective 
is based on the wolves who simply live to breeding age. But there are a couple more problems for both the wolves and also may cause you problems in court. Now that there's no longer even a pretense of cross-border natural gene dispersal between Mexico and the US, the decision to expand the MUIPA from south of I-10 to the international border, but not to expand north of I-40 to the state borders becomes arbitrary and capricious. Why? By your own data, the area north of I-40 contains 20 times more suitable wolf habitat than the area south of I-10. Anubis is only the latest wolf to show they want to disperse towards the Grand Canyon. The new rule is, quote, the reviewer, a high risk approach, unquote, to propose a single US population to be non-essential and manage it as such. To elaborate, the service can't point to a single inquiry, study, MOU, or agreement with the species survival plan participants that says that the captive population could reconstitute the loss of about 200 wolves. And there's no science which says this could be done in a reasonable time. To the contrary, by depending entirely on cross fostering, you've tied your hands. You have neither the institutions nor the institutional memory to release wolves if there are no dents for them in the wild. Again, please don't slow walk the wolves. You can do this, but it's gonna take some changes. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Next is De Dennis Babo. Still looking for Dennis. If you happen to be on a phone line, can you hit star nine, please, to raise your hand? And next after that is Rachel Boutheris. Looking for Rachel as well. Rachel, if you're online, can you hit star nine to raise your hand, please? And then Beth Ballman. Looking for Beth as well. Again, to our phone participants, if this is you, if you could hit star nine to raise your hand, please. And Catherine Dorn. Mm -hmm. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Catherine. Oh, good. Thank you. I'm Catherine Dorn. That's K-A-T-H-R-Y-N-D-O-R-N. And I'm an individual living in Arizona who would love to see, or at least hear, wolves across Arizona, including north of uh, their current I-40 boundary. I strongly support designating our Mexican gray wolf population as essential, removing all population caps, and aiming for a full restoration of the largest wolf population that the Southwest can possibly support. To that end, please, re yeah, sorry, please release more bonded wolf pairs and support their survival and reproduction in the wild. I strongly oppose the removal or take of wolves from the wild unless an individual wolf either needs medical rehabilitation or is a genuine threat to humans, not to livestock. Non-native livestock are a threat to southwestern wildlife themselves and should not be relevant to whether or not a wolf is allowed to stay in the wild. Also, please require livestock owners to take proactive, non-lethal measures to prevent wolf-livestock conflict, such as quickly removing livestock carcasses. There is no need to allow ranchers or state agencies the flexibility to impair wolves' recovery. Also, please do not provide receivers to ranchers. There is too much of a risk that someone will use the receiver data to ambush and kill wolves. And non-native livestock ranching, which again is a threat to our local ecosystems, should absolutely never be prioritized above the health and survival of native wildlife, such as wolves. And speaking of native wildlife, since apex predators such as wolves keep wild ungulate populations healthy, and instead wild ungulates and other animals are threatened by factors such as climate change, habitat destruction by humans, and competition with human-introduced livestock, Please, again, do not remove wolves from the wild in response to wild ungulate population declines. Instead, 
If you at all can, please limit the movements of livestock such as cattle, and please do not penalize wolves for leaving their management area, such as by crossing I-40, and do whatever you can to facilitate their safe crossings of any borders to improve genetic diversity. Wolves do not have a map of their plant recovery area or where they're protected, so they should be protected anywhere. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. A forest Radarian. Hi, can you hear me? We can, Forrest, go ahead. Awesome. Uh, I would just like to echo a lot of the sentiments that have been uh, expressed before. My name is Forrest, F-O-R-R-E-S-T-R-A-D-A-R-I-A-N. I reside at the Grand Canyon in Arizona. Um, I am just very supportive of seeing the uh, expansion of the wolf population. I'd love to see the removal of the I-40 northern boundaries for the uh, current population. And I would also love to see the Mexican gray wolf population designated as essential. Uh, so I encourage the agency to do what they can with that. And thank you. Thank you, Forrest. Next is Steve Dibble. Still searching for Steve. Uh, Steve, if you're on a phone line, if you could hit star nine to raise your hand, please. And after Steve is Jennifer Hart. Still looking for Jennifer as well. Jennifer, you're on a phone line, hit star nine, please. Next is Kristen Barger. Kirsten Barger, I'm sorry, Kirsten Barger. Kirsten, if you're online, if you can, if you're on a phone line, hit star nine to raise your hand, please. And next, Dallas Miller. Looking for Dallas as well. Dallas, if you could raise your hand by hitting star nine on the phone. Next is Laurel Harden. Laurel, I've granted you permission to speak. If you could uh, unmute your mic, if you're still online. Well, can you hear me? Gotcha. Yep, I can hear you now, Laurel. Thanks. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I signed up to speak. Uh, my name is Laurel Hardin, L-A-U-R-E-L, -E capital H-A-R-D-I-N. I'm the chairperson of the Earth Justice Ministry of the U Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Phoenix. I was going to speak for the wolves, but there are many more eloquent people who have said everything I would want to say and more. Uh, I highly support the reintroduction of the wolves into the expanded territory north of I-40. With climate change, they need to be able to ro um, roam farther north. Um, uh, I don't want to say anything about livestock because I can understand there's a problem there, but the wolves um, are a keystone predator who is important for the ecosystem of Arizona and the world. I think we need to support their roaming and uh, promo uh, promoting release of bonding pairs into the wild so that they can uh, establish better genetic diversity. Thank you. Thank you, Laurel. Next up is Sarah Dahl. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, Sarah, go ahead. Perfect. Hi, good evening. My name is Sarah Dahle. That's S-A-R-A-D-A-H-L-E. Um, I'm currently a student at Northern Arizona University studying environmental science. And I'm currently an intern with the Grand Canyon Wolf Recovery Project, which is an organization dedicated to helping restore the Mexican gray wolf population in the Grand Canyon. Um, to ensure this recovery of the species, we must maintain populations of 750 to 1,000 Mexican gray wolves among several different regions, including the Grand Canyon. However, the 10J rule contradicts the best available data and fails to conserve these endangered animals. 
a new plan that will lead to a larger distribution of these wolves and produce a population size that achieves ecological effectiveness should be developed. Um, it has been predicted that the Mexican gray wolves will move north in response to climate change. That said, it is upsetting that the US Fish and Wildlife Service chose to disregard any changes in geographic boundaries in their revised 10J rule. There is a suitable habitat just north of I-40 and we should be pursuing recovery in this area. However, the US Fish and Wildlife Service repeatedly prevents the wolves from returning back to the Grand Canyon region. I strongly oppose any efforts to capture wolves traveling north of I-40, and I request that the research and recovery permit section A, um, 10A, 1A, which encourages the removal of these wolves outside of their current boundaries be revised. Lastly, labeling the Mexican gray wolves as not essential completely dis dismisses um, scientific information that has been based on over two decades of wolf reintroduction data. Mexican gray wolves are essential to the overall health of our ecosystems and therefore they should be treated as such. I request that the status of the experimental population of these Mexican gray wolves be changed to essential under the Endangered Species Act, providing them with full protection under the law. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Next up is Patricia Estrella. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Patricia, go ahead. Hi, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Patricia Estrella. I'm with Defenders of Wildlife and it's P-A-T-R-I-C-I-A-E-S-T-R-E-L-L-A. -E Today, I'm gonna to focus on only one issue, which is the improper unessential desi designation. The wild United States population is essential for at least four reasons. First, it is the only viable Mexican wolf population in the wild. Second, the captive population is too genetically compromised to serve as a viable founder population. Third, the wild population is the only one over which the service has control. And fourth, an essential designation aligns with Congress's intent because the Mexican wolf is not, quote, most cases. The service claims that if the entire wild population went extinct, the subspecies could still recover because there are enough wolves in captivity to reestablish a new population. However, availability of captive wolves wholly misses the point, which is that the wild population is the means of recovery for the Mexican wolf. Wild extinction would mean losing approximately 5% of the remaining gene diversity and more than two decades of local adaptation and cultural knowledge that have created a truly wild population. The captive population cannot replace these. The rule also glosses over the significant genetic decline of the captive population, which has lost at least 17% of the low original gene diversity. The SSP goal is to lose less than 10. Thus, the captive population is seriously compromised and cannot be relied on to reestablish a new viable wild population. I'm gonna move on to my fourth point, which is that finally designating the wild population as essential aligns with Congress's intent. By distinguishing between essential and non-essential, Congress clearly intended for the service to conduct a case-by-case -case analysis with a handful of cases like the Mexican wolf warranting essential designation. We are in a unique situation right now. We are not establishing a small population from a relatively robust wild or captive one. We are releasing wolves into new areas to recover the species. This is clearly the kind of case Congress contemplated when it created an essential designation. For these four reasons and more, the wild population is essential and must be designated as such. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Next up is Sue Libby. Can you hear me? Yes, Sue, I can, go ahead. Hi, I'm Sue Libby and I am the co-leader of the Great Old Broads for Wilderness uh, Tucson Area Broadband. Uh, I have had the fortune or misfortune of having been a snow, snowbird for a large portion of my life. Uh, part of my time has always been spent uh, in the state of Wisconsin, uh, equally divided between Wisconsin and Tucson. And although these are two separate wolf populations, I see the same kind of dynamics being played out as far as this unfortunate, poor unfortunate species of animal is concerned. Um, in Wisconsin, uh, the biologists also recommended that the population be between 800 and 1,000 animals. And politically, it was whittled down to 350 animals 
which most of the wildlife biologists agreed uh, is a non-viable population, especially with uh, mange, car strikes, and all the other ways uh, that of wolf mortality. Uh, that is simply non-viable. I also have to agree that the number that the Arizona uh, plan is currently speaking of in regards to the Mexican gray wolf is also uh, biologically a non-viable number. I agree with the previous speakers, uh, all of whom said that the population should be between at least 750 to 1,000. Um, I also agree with previous speakers about the I-40 uh, artificial boundary. Uh, same thing again with Wisconsin, artificial boundaries created by humans. Uh, that do not apply to the actual laws of nature. Our regulations and policy must begin to follow the laws of nature rather than vice versa, having to try nature uh, fit into all of our human developed uh, constructs. And I thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Sue. Next up is Esther Gonzalez, Esther. Hello. Hi, my name is Esther Gonzalez and I'm uh, from the neighboring state private citizen in California. I'm writing to you um, to demand, uh, well, that the US Fish and Wildlife uh, follow the court order and um, not cap the amount of uh, what, uh, Mexican wild uh, wolves, please. Uh, they are essential and, um, you know, they, there's plenty of uh, science-based information that shows how they help to um, you know, rewild and, and just really nourish um, the environment. And I, you know, I, I would really like to see um, more wildlife, not livestock. Livestock is not wildlife. So I, I don't understand why everything kind of set, centers around livestock. So um, you know, I, I don't think they should be held more highly just because it's a, a cash crop or not crop, but you know, for cash. So I, I hope we'll consider this and, and do give them an essential designation. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Uh, next up is Don Bridson. And just remind everybody if you could uh, say, uh, state your name and, and spell it for us, we'd sure appreciate that. So Don, are you there? Still looking for Don. Don, if you're on the phone, if you could hit star nine, please. Okay, next is Hope Carr. Uh, Hope, I see you online. I'm gonna switch functions here just a moment. I'm gonna have to, with an older version of Zoom, I'm getting a message on the screen that I need to promote you to a panelist. So one moment here and we'll try that. A promotion. Can y'all hear me now? Yes, Hope, go ahead. Great, thank you. My name is Hope Carr, that's H-O-P-E-C-A-R-R. -R. I am the chairperson for the Texas Lobo Coalition. We are a newly founded nonprofit organization dedicated to reintroducing the Mexican gray wolf to a portion of its historic range in West Texas through collaboration with stakeholders and government entities. Currently, it is not legal in Texas for wolves to be released in the state. However, we feel this is a violation of the Endangered Species Act, which should be providing a framework to protect endangered species and their habitats. Mexican gray wolves historically played a role as key apex predators throughout much of West Texas prior to being extirpated in the 1970s. They should be reestablished in a portion of this range. We understand many stakeholders will have concerns and even openly oppose such efforts, but we believe that by initially introducing a small managed population and offering mitigation in the cases of livestock losses, we can achieve a harmonious reintroduction. The current population of Mexican gray wolves in New Mexico and Arizona is inadequate to support the genetic diversity that is absolutely crucial for the survival of this essential species. An essential species, particularly one with a role as an apex predator should not be capped, but rather managed in a manner that allows them to reach their natural carrying capacity. This species should be allowed to roam to expand into their entire historic range, including West Texas under government protection. Furthermore, an experimental management area should absolutely be included in West Texas. 
This would not only expand their area of benefit, but could also provide a route to connect populations between the U United States and Mexico, further bolstering genetic diversity and gene flow. Wolves may never inhabit as many places as they once did due to human expansion. However, currently little is done to help, help wolf populations succeed. The US Fish and Wildlife Service should be doing much more to ensure their survival. Ranchers and stakeholders in wolf populated areas should be supported and required by the US Fish and Wildlife Service to pursue non-lethal conflict avoidance techniques. More funding should be provided to law enforcement efforts limiting poaching of wolves. Finally, education is the key of, to the success of any species. The US Fish and Wildlife Service should be providing outreach education programs for the communities that will be most impacted by reintroductions. Thanks y'all. Thank you, Hope. Uh, Terry Morris. Up next. Terry, are you there? Terry's Terry. unmuted. Terry, your mic is unmuted. Go ahead. Terry, are you there? Okay, um, we can't hear you, Terry. If you're if you're speaking, um, Rick, should we come back to Terry? We can try to come back after a few more folks and see if uh, Terry's resolved uh, any any tech issues on that side. Okay. Next is Elizabeth Collins. Elizabeth. Elizabeth, are you there? Rick, is Elizabeth there? I don't see Elizabeth. Now, looking for Elizabeth as well. Again, if you, uh, for our folks on the phone, if you could hit star nine, if uh, you're Elizabeth, that would help us identify you. Okay, uh, jo Joanne um, Kellen Bez, Benz. Don't see Joanne either. Again, if you're on the phone, if you could hit star nine to identify your line, please. Drew Martin. Next, Drew's here. Yes, can you hear me? I can, Drew, go ahead. Uh, my name is Drew Martin, D-R-E-W-M-A-R-T-I-N. I'm from South Florida. I am a volunteer with the Sierra Club, but I am speaking on my own behalf. I'm a strong proponent of the reintroduction of the Mexican wolf into the, its native environment. I believe strongly that the numbers that you have established are not high enough to provide the genetic diversity that is required. And as someone who has seen the difficulties with the reintroduction of the Florida panther, I can say that the limitation of the geographic territory can be a very problematic as in order for the panthers to become successful, they need to move far north into areas that they once lived in, and I believe the Mexican wolf needs the same thing. I also think that the concern of allowing ranchers to kill wolves that uh, predate on their cattle is problematic because ranchers are predisposed to not like the wolves and want to go out of their way to kill them. We also see a, a lot of poaching going on, and that's extremely problematic. So I think there needs to be much stronger uh, penalties for those poaching wolves. I also am concerned about the sharing of tele telemetry data. I, I think that that can be very problematic because people use that as a way to locate the wolves and kill them. I think much more needs to be done to keep cattle out of areas that are basically designated as wilderness and wild so that wolves can utilize those areas. I also believe that you need to allow the wolves to move over larger distances and uh, so that they can 
continue to breed and carry on in larger geographic regions. I appreciate the efforts that you're making and I wanna thank you very much, but I hope you will do more in the future to bring back the Mexican wolf. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Uh, next is Steve uh, Zav Zavonik. Steve, are you there? Hi there, my name is Steve Zvadnik. Last name is spelled Z is in Zulu, A is in Alpha, V is in Victor, O is in Oscar, D is in Delta, N is in Nancy, Y is in Yankee, I is in India, K is in Kilo. Uh, so as I said, my name is Steve Zvadnik and I represent all the members of the general public who are completely disgusted with how this reintroduction has been handled. Earlier this evening, uh, someone stated I'm not sure, perhaps it was John Oakleaf. Quote, the closer you get to wolves, the more opposition there is. This is a remarkable statement. I can think of no other example of a species expected to rebound from near extinction under the threat of, under the constraint of random lines drawn on a map. But wait, not only are the boundaries totally arbitrary, they are also so comically restricted that new pups must constantly be flown in just to keep the population from crashing. Again, I can think of no other species expected to thrive under such awful conditions. Add to the fact that there are no meaningful consequences to murdering wolves. Now consider that it takes getting sued in court and losing in court for the government agencies tasked with overseeing wolf, re wolf recovery to even consider minor changes to the current travesty. It raises the question, why are these agencies so committed to sabotaging wolf reintroduction? Well, thanks for your time. Thank you, Steve. Uh, next is Alexis Mills. Hey there, thank you for this opportunity. Go ahead, we hear you. Okay, so uh, Steve, that was amazing. Um, I have to agree with you. Um, this seems to me, um, listening to you all at Fish and Wildlife, it reminds me of the mouthpiece scientists in Don't Look Up. Uh, I feel like you do want to see the wolves uh, recover, but something is keeping you from pursuing that mission. So I have lived up in wolf country and I never had the opportunity to hear one. I've tried repeatedly. Um, did you know that the cattle industry contributed less than $8 million um, to Arizona economy? but outdoor recreation is in the tens of billions of dollars. Uh, people love wolves. Ranchers who hate them uh, are not doing enough to protect their cattle. Uh, they're relying on fish and wildlife to just kill them and remove them. Um, most people support recovery of the wolves who also contribute to the ecological well-being of taking out animals that are diseased, keeping animals from overgrazing riverbanks, especially ones that have been overgrazed, like in Pueblo Park. I saw uh, signs that were vandalized by ranchers and fences that had been torn down so their cattle could go into wolf territory. And this is unacceptable. So these things need to be addressed so that the wolves can really recover and come back and, and be where they need to be um, in a, a healthy ecological environment. Thank you so much, bye. Thank you, Alexis. Uh, let's see if we, um, we were gonna try and touch base back with Terry Morris. Um, Terry, if, if you're on the line, um, we tried a little bit earlier, maybe can, are you there? Terry, are you you there? Guess not. Okay. Well, let's let's keep going then. Um, Stephanie Farrick. 
I don't see Stephanie out there. Stephanie, if you're on the phone line, if you could hit star nine to unmute your line, please, or to uh, raise your hand, rather. And Sandra Wheeler listed next. I haven't seen Sandra yet either. Sandra, if you're on the phone, if you could star nine. Stephanie Smith. Stephanie Smith. Yes, Stephanie. I'm here. Can you hear oh. me? Yes, Stephanie, go ahead. We can hear you. Good. Um, I, I like the comments that uh, others have made before me. I think they're honing in right on the specifics. So what I will do is um, focus on the things that I think are most important. Um, one that I uh, specifically object to is the restrictions on the borders, the I-40, uh, and even the states that um, Montana being an example, if you go into that state, you're in big trouble if you're a wolf. Um, Mexico, you've got the border on that side. And um, I am in Texas, so I am familiar with the uh, terrain over near El Paso. And I was concerned because um, New Mexico being exactly uh, next to Texas, it's a very good likelihood that they could expand into Texas and they need to have the protection if they do uh, go beyond that barrier. Um, I think that the uh, designated area is um, way too small. It's like having a cage, it just happens to be a little bigger. Probably the best example is the uh, wolves that disappeared from Al Rol Al, uh, where they had a designated population, but they were limited to a certain area and they eventually died. So I think that there has to be an expansion of the territory. Uh, that's actually quite a good natural control because wolves kill wolves and coyotes and other animals for food, obviously. The conflict uh, for not having this natural control is the uh, fish and wildlife and other management situations call this harvesting. It's just killing, period. It's not a harvest. They're, <laughs> they're not going there for the meat. Uh, so uh, I think that that's wrong, flat wrong. Um, the um, uh, Montana is planning to uh, get rid of 90% of their wolves. So from a state standpoint, the legislator made that rule, not necessarily the fish and wildlife. So I think that has to be part of your plan. Uh, yes, oops, they are essential and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Annette, next, next is Annette Sunda. Go ahead, Annette. Hello, and um, my name is Annette Sunda. That's A-N-N-E-T-T-E-S-U-N-D-A. -E -E um, first, I would like to thank you all for the hard work that you have put in. I know that this recovery project has been going on since before 1998. And um, I think that everyone in this meeting is aware that the Mexican gray wolf is essential. So I would like to, you know, add my comments that you designate the Mexican gray wolf as essential so that these wolves that you have worked so hard for are given the full protection under the law. Um, some of the recent news articles, I, I can't talk about them. I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I can't, but you understand what I'm um, the next thing I'd like to talk about is a measure of genetic diversity. Anywhere you guys go out with your helicopters and all the wolves get their physicals. Check the genetic diversity of the wolves out there and take a measurement like scientific. Like let's, let's get some science in here, folks. That's what we're based on, right? We're scientists here. Um, I would also like to limit the intentional human caused mortality. We're not just talking about the ranchers and the hunters, but everything involved. These are an endangered species and require our protection. Um, and I would also like all agencies involved with the Mexican wolf recovery projects 
to be held accountable, including Fish and Wildlife Service and the Game and Fish Departments. Um, again, I would like to thank you for your hard work. I know a lot of you have been working on this project for over 20 years, and I thank you for bringing wolves back into our territory because I think not just me, but I think a lot of people on the line tonight majestic animals and they belong in the forest. So thank you very much. Thank you, Annette. Uh, next is Gerard McGill. Gerard, are you there? Yes, hello. Go ahead, we can hear you. <clears throat> My name is uh, Gerard McGill. That's G-E-R-R-A-R-D-M-C-G-I-L-L. -L. I'm a concerned member of the public, I guess. Uh, which shows the power of this issue. Um, I applaud all the uh, points made by previous speakers tonight. And I also applaud the work of the service to get this keystone species back up and running. But um, I'm a little concerned that by not designating uh, this species essential, they're leaving a little to chance in the future uh, of the survival of this species to assume that uh, that they can, you know, if things start going wrong, that they can rebuild the population from the captive population and uh, the population of Mexico, um, and therefore not uh, not make it remaking this uh, species essential, is leaving things just a little to chance, and uh, that would be my worry, and I would voice that worry to the servers. Thank you. Thank you, Gerard. Uh, Jared, um, next is Chris Albert. Chris, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Chris. Uh, my name is Chris Albert, C-H-R-I-S-A-L-B-E-R-T. For Mexican gray wolves to survive, they need to have several robust connected populations. Some population scientists recommend at least 750 to 1,000 individuals. And it is important not to put a cap on wolf numbers if more can thrive. I am glad to see the cap on Mexican gray wolves removed in your proposal. Like many people, I am still concerned that the current population of Mexican gray wolves is deemed non-essential. If all of them were destroyed tomorrow, we would have only the 40 in Mexico and captive Mexican gray wolves in the US. Captive wolves do not hunt, feed themselves, deal with danger, and it seems that thinking of them as fully functional wolves is risky. They may be genetically wolves, but what epigenetic changes has captivity caused? I am concerned that as climate change impacts the land and its suitability, we need to be flexible in where we allow Mexican gray wolves to go and whether the recovery area will need to be adjusted. I would like to see this addressed. <clears throat> I am a veterinarian and as such, I have a great deal of admiration, respect and empathy for ranchers trying to make a living. Wolves make that harder, but not impossible. We need to make every effort to allow wolves to be in our ecosystems. That includes requirements and assistance for non-lethal deterrence and punishment for inappropriate killing of wolves. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Carolyn Nelson. Go ahead, Carolyn. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. All right, C-A-R-O-L-Y-N. Nelson, N-E-L-S-O-N. Say, so I haven't heard in this presentation how many animals have been killed this year, uh, depredation by wolves. And from what I understand, it's just under 140 uh, this year. Uh, that includes livestock, that includes horses, that includes some pets, dogs, and a burrow. One burrow was confirmed killed. Um, it's a shame, I'm not sure what to say. Uh, in 1866, I've said this before, but I'm gonna say it again. In 1866, a Senator from Indiana um, wanted to sell part of the timber reservations in order to pay the debt from the Civil War. And a Senator from Nevada said, you can't, there's already claims out there. There's already, the water's been vested and appropriated. Uh, the range has been vested and appropriated. There are already rights out there on that land. 
And obviously they didn't sell the timber reservations. They later became national forests. So my concern is we're, I'm a rancher. I have ranching neighbors who've had wolves kill yearlings in their corral in next to their barn uh, two months ago. We are a minority. Our story does not get out there. And I think when you do these presentations, you need to tell about the depredations because it is wonderful to hear a wolf howl, but it is not wonderful to see how they kill. And that's just part of the story. The whole story needs to get out there. Ranchers have rights and, and I hope they're recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Next up is Cian Alvin. Still looking for Cian. Uh, Cian, if you are, if you happen to be on the phone, if you could hit star nine to raise your hand, please. Okay. Uh, next, uh, Danny Hoots. Can you hear me fine? Yes, Danny, go ahead. We can hear you. Well, my name is Danny Hoots. That's D A N I H O O T S. I'm speaking as a concerned citizen in the Phoenix metro area. I do have a master's in urban environmental planning from ASU and focused a lot on environmental injustice and conservation efforts. Um, well, someone, I'm somewhat new to the conservation efforts to wolves specifically in Arizona. Spent the last month reading over research done for Mexican wolves and wolves in the US in general, along with looking over the entire updated plan and the transcripts of the past two hearings. It's very concerning that this new updated plan um, doesn't actually update some of the most important topics that research has so shown us. This group of wolves in the recovery plan should be considered essential as there aren't that many wolves in Mexico and the ones in captivity would not be able to replace the ones we have in Arizona. Not only that, but the number should be, to be considered healthy is way underestimated as plenty of research has shown us um, that it needs to be 750 to 1,000 wolves in the wild. And this is shown in like a lot of research um, by sci leading scientists. And I know it's not the point that it revisions, but the arbitrary line at the I-40 needs to be updated. We've gathered more da data on where historical wolves roamed and research has demonstrated that they roam further north than realized. Not to mention that the human cities and developments that are now in the way of many of these wolves um, where they used to roam. If these wolves can expand further north, research had determined that it could be more viable as there would be less human interaction and there's plenty of prey for the wolves to feed on. Um, I'll be adding more details and written comments along with some friends who are in the biology field that couldn't be here today. Um, but thank you for providing this time to comment and all the um, stuff you guys have been doing. Thank you, Danny. Uh, next is Janie Chodish. Mute. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Janie, go ahead. Hi, thank you for um, letting me speak. I don't really have anything um, new to add. I really just am here to um, back up all of the things that I've heard from people like um, Mary Catherine Ray um, and others. Um, I always find, oh, and I'm supposed to spell my name. Um, sorry, it's J-A-N-I-E. And my last name is C-H-O-D-O-S-H. Um, I am an environmental educator <clears throat> and a writer and an outdoors person, and I did want to parrot something someone else said, um, that the members of the outdoor community uh, do contribute immensely to the economy, and sometimes I feel like that is overlooked, um, how many people in sort of a new economy are spending more time outside and want to interact and see and know about healthy ecosystems, and to have a healthy ecosystem, which we all agree on, we need wolves. Um, I keep thinking that we already once virtually exterminated them and we do need to make sure this doesn't happen again. And I am fearful that the proposed draft does not ensure this. Um, and the main thing that I want to make my point is that I'd like to see that um, their change, the designation is changed to essential. 
and that they are given the full protection under the law. Um, other than that, I, I just want to support um, many of the things about numbers and connectivity and allowing them to have a bigger range that others have already said. So thank you very much. Thank you, Janie. Next is Edwina Vogan. Edwina Vogan. I, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, Edwina. Great. Thank you for the opportunity to, com to comment. Um, I do want to echo a lot of the comments that have been made, essentially, I hey, think- Edwina, if you could just give, uh, uh, say your name. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I need to spell. Yes. Sorry. Ed yeah, Edwina, it's E-D-W-I-N-A, and the last name is Vogan, V like in Victor, O-G-A-N. Um, I, I want to echo um, several different things that many of the speakers have already mentioned. I feel like um, the Mexican gray wolf should be designated essential. Um, we're seeing so many um, mammal species that are having a hard time in the United States and, and the way the numbers are going, um, they're having a hard time surviving. And I think the Mexican gray wolf is one of those with um, not many releases and um, the poaching that occurs um, in the state. Uh, I think many people would support the continued uh, program if they knew more about it. And um, I just want to say to Carolyn, she's probably not on the on the um, on the line now, but that I don't think anybody wants to put anybody out of business. I think what we what might be helpful for U.S. Fish and Wildlife is to conduct circles where more people um, of differing opinions could actually talk together and find out some of the commonalities that they have in terms of um, their livelihood and um, living in Arizona. Um, I also think there would be, um, it would be a good idea to have documentation, scientific documentation about the killings, um, the breakdowns and um, how um, we could, could, could be more informed as the public about um, what, what the methods of uh, poaching are. I think that's real important to conserve the species. And I also think um, we should allow the Mexican wolf north of I-40. They're going there anyway. Uh, climate change is definitely in force um, and other species are moving forward in that direction north. And so I wanna thank you for, again, for the opportunity and I hope you will consider my comments. Thank you, Edwina. Next is Lee Bowes. Hello, everyone can hear me okay? Go ahead, Lee, we can hear you. Hello, uh, thank you so much. My name is Leah Bose, it's L-E-A-H, last name Bose, Bravo, Oscar, Sierra, Echo. I'm a public lands user and passionate individual for wolf recovery in the wild. I'm also a dedicated volunteer at a local wolf conservation center, yet I'm speaking on the, my own behalf. Uh, the 2015 Mexican gray wolf 10J management rule does not rely on best available science and violates the Endangered Species Act by failing to conserve the endangered gray wolf. Wolves are vital and essential to a healthy ecosystem and their role as a keystone species is critically paramount to promoting the natural landscape. Therefore, they must be designated as essential. Intentional human caused mortality must be limited and firm requirements must be implemented to prevent conflicts with livestock while supporting non-lethal resolution of conflicts. Regarding wild ungulates, there should be no take, there should be no take in response for wolf impact as it's inappropriate and not aligned with the scientific understanding of trophic cascades within the natural ecosystem. I strongly recommend and support an expanded experimental population area as the current boundaries are not sustainable to a long-term recovery plan. Artificial barriers such as the border wall and highways inhibit population growth and as climate change impacts available environment, approving boundary expansions would help to support a more viable recovery based on best available science. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service must be accountable for measuring genetic diversity and inbreeding of the wild population. The current proposed cap is far too low to account for the sustainable population growth and should be increased to about to 1,000 or above. Genetic diversity must be promoted by including measurable standards for assuring progress towards recovery benchmark based on best available science. Thank you for your time, your efforts, and your consideration. Thank you, Leah. Next is uh, Aaron Kearns. Yes, good evening. 
<clears throat> my name is Aaron Kearns, first name A-R-R-O-N, last name K-E-R-N-S. I'm not representing a specific group organization. I'm speaking as a concerned citizen. I've studied wolves in my pursuit of higher education, and I do volunteer at Wolf Sanctuary. We, as humans, must learn to live harmoniously with our natural world. Wolves in America are having a difficult time. Wolf populations in the lower 48 United States are 5,500 gray wolves, 30 red wolves in the wild, and 200 in captivity. Now, 186 Mexican wolves. In 2021, there were 27 plant and animal species listed as extinct. We had the opportunity to prevent Mexican wolves from being added to this growing list of extinct species. However, 300 Mexican wolves are not enough to provide genetic diversity. According to some of the world's wolf scientists, there needs to be 1,000 wolves in order to provide this genetic diversity in order for this species to continue. This brings me to the I-40 northern boundary. I can understand the establishment of the experimental zone for the start of your program. However, to limit Mexican wolves in this area is counterintuitive. It reminds me of what we did to the indigenous people of this country when they were forced on the reservations. These wolves need to be able to repopulate various areas and expand their territories. With that said, there must be actions taken for the wolves to be able to cross major highways safely, uh, such as wildlife tunnels or bridges. Since I mentioned the indigenous people of this country, I encourage you to include these native people when it comes to Mexican wolf recovery. These people have diverse perspectives with their wolves, with wolves within their tribes. I would also like to encourage the Fish and Wildlife Service and the American government to not delist these wolves for from the Endangered Species Act. If they are delisted to population of 300, these animals could be killed by humans like what happened to gray wolves when they were delisted under the Trump administration. I would like to ask the service and the American government to enact strict laws on killing of Mexican wolves and that punishment be swift and severe to those who violate these laws. In conclusion, I would like to ask the service and the government to not bow to special interest groups and money from these groups who want to hunt and destroy these essential animals. We have the opportunity to reverse the human caused decline in Mexican wolf population and protect these animals for future gener generations. Thank you for your time, the opportunity to speak, and all that you're doing to help Mexican wolves. Thank you, Aaron. Next is Jim Unmacht. If I pronounce that right, Jim. You're close. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Jim. Go ahead. My name is Jim Unmacht, J-I-M-U-N-M-A-C-H-T. I'm the executive director for Arizona Sportsmen for Wildlife Conservation, and I'm speaking tonight on behalf of our organization and 25 of our member groups representing hunting, angling, outdoor recreation, and wildlife conservation organizations. For the record, based on our June 15, 2020 letter, we are in favor of the recovery of the Mexican wolf. Uh, we support the recovery plan. And I'll deviate some from tonight's speakers and tell you that we support alternative two, which hasn't been addressed yet this evening. We're okay with the non-essential experimental population designation. We are good with the MOEPA boundaries, leaving them unchanged. We're fine with the average that's being proposed. We support the genetic diversity component that's being addressed. However, the take provisions, current provisions permitted for take of wolves in response to human livestock conflicts or impacts to ungulate populations, we believe ought to remain in place. Finally, I'd like to note that those expanded take provisions in the 2015 10J rule are critical to the recovery effort. The Moipa is a working landscape where wolves must be managed in a manner that is compatible with other resources and activities. The ability to remove wolves causing depredation on domestic livestock or unaccept unacceptable impacts on wild ungulate populations has been essential to building social acceptance for reintroduction of wolves in this area. Our organization notes that proactive adaptive management and compensatory strategies have been successful so that the increased take provisions have not resulted in the removal of any depredating wolves. Removals that have occurred for other reasons have been relatively few with no disadvantage to wolf recovery or genetic integrity. That said, the 2015 increased take provisions could be needed in the future. Removing them will set the stage for significant adverse social and economic consequences and potentially put the re entire recovery effort at risk. 
These provisions should be included in the final rule. I appreciate the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Up next is Jana Rogers. Jana? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Jana, go ahead. Hello? Yes, we can hear you, go ahead. Can you, you can't hear me? We can hear you, Jana, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Hi, my name is Jana Rogers, J-A-N-A-R-O-G-E-R-S. I'm a professional conservation photographer and I currently live in Montana where I've been actively engaged in the gray wolf legislation. Um, I strongly support designating Mexican gray wolves as essential. Listing as non-essential diminishes existing wolf reintroduction data and does not align with science-based management. There is suitable wolf habitat north of I-40 and it's essential to re remove this artificial boundary. Wolves will move north due to climate change and we should be prepared for this. I strongly oppose removal of wolves north of I-40. We need to support wolves' ability to roam. This limited territory for an apex predator is not realistic. The current cap for wolves in the Arizona plan is a non-viable number. These numbers are not high enough to allow genetic diversity. The population should be at least 750 to 1,000. Wild extinction of Mexican wolves would mean losing gene diversity. The captive population cannot replace this. 17% of gene diversity has been lost in the captive population. For this reason, the wild population must be classified as essential and given full protection. The cattle industry should not be prioritized over publicly entrusted wildlife. The fact that cattle can graze for $1.35 a month on public land while justifying the killing of publicly entrusted wildlife needs serious reevaluation. Non-lethal techniques are extremely successful and this need to, needs to be a real focus, working with the ranching community to find solutions. Prioritizing and providing education and outreach should be a real focus. Cattle producers should not be given transceivers because this can be easily abused. Poaching is also a significant issue and there needs to be significant fines. I recognize the hard work you're doing and thank you all for being here. I know a lot of you have been working on these issues and the reintroduction for many years. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Jana. Uh, next is Molly Wortelli. Molly, are you there? Molly, are you there? Okay. Uh, still, yeah, still looking for Molly. Molly, if you happen to be on a phone line, if you could hit star nine to raise your hand, please. Okay, next, uh, Deborah Taylor. Go ahead, Deborah. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Deborah, go ahead. Thank you. My name is Deborah Taylor, D E B R A T A Y L O R. Um, I'm a retired public librarian that spent the last 18 months of my retirement researching prion diseases. So I'm going to talk about them a bit. Um, the current 10J rule states wolves will have reach recovery when their population hits 325. This rule is not consistent with any recovery plan, nor approved by any wildlife organization that I follow. Forget the divisiveness of politics. <clears throat> Fish and Wildlife Services has based decisions of other species on science, and I appreciate that. And I, as a voter, a mother, and a grandmother, ask you to return to science. You know that more than 150 pairs of wolves are necessary for long-term conservation. Think of genetics. Follow science. I ask you to consider placing several packs in the national forests and reservation areas, if the tribes agree, where CWD is currently testing positive high. You know those areas. 
um, remove the upper limit, um, institute education to ranchers and hunters where wolves are returned. They know the hazing things. Wolves will only go where they scent the diseased animals. You know that some GMU areas are presently are presenting high percentages of CWD. Ignoring CWD will only allow it to increase. We need increasing wolf numbers, not a limit of wolves. Wolves should be designated essential. I don't have enough time to read the last paragraph, but thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Deborah. Next is Stan Renfro. Stan Renfro. Still looking for Stan. Stan, if you happen to be on the phone line, if you could hit star nine to raise your hand, please. And Heather, Heather Lank. Heather, go ahead. Hello, my name is Heather Link, spelled H-E-A-T-H-E-R-L-E-N-K. And I am a genetics graduate student who has an academic interest in the Mexican gray wolf. But today I am only speaking as an Arizona resident and not a representative of any institution. I applaud the Fish and Wildlife Services efforts to recover the Mexican gray wolf along with some of the proposed changes but I do have a few concerns I would like to address today. The first is that according to the 10J wolf, 22 Mexican wolf, wolves must be released and survived to breeding age in order to fulfill the genetic recovery criteria. My concern is that the plan does not address exactly how the, it's gonna be determined that those 22 Mexican wolves actually survive and contribute their genetics to the population. So I request that the Fish and Wildlife Service add a detailed explanation of how they are going to ensure this. My second concern regards the I-40 northern boundary. And, my, and I understand that this is based off of the historical range as defined by morphological data. However, mitochondrial DNA data has indicated that the subspecies historical range is underestimated and that it existed north of I-40. To help further understand this issue and I, to, to help understand the historical range of the Mexican wolf better, I recommend that the service either fund or perform a study itself to analyze the nuclear DNA of, me, of historical gray wolves that existed north of I-40 to determine whether this area was part of the Mexican gray wolf's historical range. Even if the service decides not to reintroduce Mexican wolves to that area, I ask that they please remove the I-40 boundary so that Mexican wolves can be colonized this region if they so choose to desire, which as M2520 has shown, wolves are willing to inhabit it this area. Once again, thank you for your work and for the opportunity to comment on this recovery plan. I look forward to the day where Mexican wolves are recovered. Thank you, Heather. Next is Kat Anises. Still looking for Kat. Kat, if you're on the phone, if you could hit star nine to raise your hand, please. Okay, uh, Mary Sykes. Looking for Mary as well. Again, Mary, if you're on a phone line, if you could identify with a star nine. Okay. Harry, no. Uh, Karen Michael. Go ahead, Karen. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Um, you, can you hear me? Yes, Karen, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm Karen Michael, K A R E N M I C H A E L, with the Animal Defense League of Arizona. We'll also be submitting more comprehensive written comments. We agree with many of the excellent comments expressed in this hearing. While we appreciate the efforts and positive steps taken by the service, they don't go far enough to ensure the long-term survival of the Mexican wolf. As the court determined, the non-essential designation of the Mexican gray wolf population was not based on the best available science and relied on outdated data from 1998. It is imperative that the service designate Mexican gray wolves as essential. 
Like countless others, we were devastated by the news that the young Mexican gray wolf Anubis was illegally shot and killed after traveling hundreds of miles and living peacefully in Kebab National Forest. His death underscores the need to have arbitrary boundaries removed and the recovery area expanded to include connectivity and vast excellent wolf habitat north of I-40 and the Grand Canyon region. Wolves should not be removed for the while for roaming beyond these boundaries. Moreover, there's a need for additional connected populations and strategies implemented to improve the genetics of the wild population. More steps need to be taken to address the high number of killings of Mexican wolves. This should include stronger legal protection, strict law enforcement, and a comprehensive campaign to educate the public on the endangered Mexican wolf. The service should also include strong requirements to prevent conflicts with, li li with livestock, support non-lethal resolutions of conflicts, and prohibit the removal of wolves from the wild for preying on carcasses of livestock. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Karen. Next, uh, Rebecca Steffoff. Still looking for Rebecca. Rebecca, if you're on the phone line, if you could help uh, us identify you by hitting star nine. Okay, uh, next, uh, Daniela Ledner, sir. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Daniela, oh, go ahead. Hi, yeah, Daniela Ledner, so D-A-N-I-E-L-L-A, -L -L -A, and last name is L-E-D-N-I-C-E-R. There is really not much that I can add after all these amazing comments um, for the overwhelming majority. But just to reiterate, I also support designation of the Mexican gray wolf as essential at this point. What may have worked in 1998 or 2015 doesn't always make sense in 2022. Uh, the world has rapidly changed as we all know. Um, and also just to reiterate the, uh, it's, it makes sense to let the uh, Mexican gray wolf expand its range beyond uh, the I-40 corridor simply because um, it reduces the, the conflicts uh, that one person had, had brought up the concerns about wolves near livestock, they've got to go somewhere. So um, that's pretty much all I have to say. Also, um, there really does need to be stiffer penalties for those who act in bad faith and who poach or illegally uh, poison or act in bad faith uh, when it comes to uh, wolf-human conflict. Um, and those are my thoughts. Thank you for considering my comments and all the best. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, next, uh, Arlisha Langford. Still looking for Arlisha. Arlisha, if you're on a phone line, if you could hit star nine to raise your hand, please. Okay. Uh, next, Pat Pesco. Go ahead, Pat. Go ahead, we can hear you. Pat, you have the permission to speak there. If you can unmute your line. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Can you, can you hear? I can hear you. If you can turn down your speaker, please, so we lose the feedback. Okay. Can you hear now? Um, why is it doing that? Just to say. We have a computer speaker turned up. Um, let me turn this off. Just a minute. There you go. There you go. You're good now. Are you okay? Am I okay? No. No. All right. Just one. One more minute. I'm sorry. Can you hear now? It's be it's better, but it, there's a little bit of an echo still. Um, let's 
see here. I don't know what to do. Um, yeah. Um, well, Pat, why don't why don't we come back to you, um, Arlisha? Did did you raise your hand? Um, if you if you Rick, I don't know if we can switch to Arlisha. Arlisha yeah. Or, um, I, I just muted muted Pat for the moment. Arlisha, I see. If is that you on a phone line there with a raised hand? Okay. The um, seven seven one five number is unmuted. Is anyone there? Uh, it's me. Yes. Uh, my name is Pat Pesco. Oh, great. Yeah, we can oh. hear you on the phone. Yeah. Great. Um, yes, um, I am just, uh, I would like to just state that um, I am very concerned about the viable Mexican gray wolf population. Um, losing the population of wolves in Arizona and New Mexico would be, um, I feel, devastating to their recovery. Um, many scientists have recommended that the population be stabilized at somewhere between 800 to 1,000. Um, your number is, um, of, I believe it's 320, is inadequate to, inter, um, to ensure their survival. Um, your suggested population should not be based on average, um, but should be allowed to reach a point of ecological effectiveness, allowing wolves to adapt to their role as predators. Um, I'm worried about climate change and how it, it might impact them. And your plan should accommodate for changes in habitat, water, um, and vegetation and prey species for these wolves uh, due to climate change. Um, you need to do more to protect human cause mortality, including um, illegal killing. Um, there should be limits on the taking of wolves um, and they should be made um, uh, permanent, not temporary. Uh, so, um, um, if the Mexican gray wolf was better protected, their numbers would be higher today. Um, nobody's mentioned um, indigenous populations. Uh, if they have, I've missed it. But there are tribes that should be consulted also, and they sh their input should be considered. Um, I believe that they need to be an essential. They need to be designated essential. And um, their boundaries definitely need to... Um, um, move uh, past the I-40 corridor north. They need more room. And with climate change, they're going to have to go north. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Pat. Um, Amy Knutson is up next. Amy Knutson. Again, Amy, if you're on a phone line... If you could hit star nine to identify yourself. While we're waiting on Amy, um, if there are any other uh, speak, that's our list of speakers that we've gone or, or people that have registered that we've gone through. If there's anyone else that registered to speak that didn't have a chance, if you could, uh, if you're online, if you could hit the um, raise hand button right now, if you'd like to speak. Uh, and if you're on the phone, if you can hit star nine. Um, Amy or or anybody else that registered, um, raise your hand or hit the star nine button. Okay, I'm going to assume that means we've got everybody that wanted to speak that had registered. I we ha do have a few minutes, so let's go ahead and open. If there's anybody else on the call that that would like to make a comment, whether you registered or not, um, and we of course we don't want to go back and start on new comments. Um, but um, uh, ra raise your hand um, uh, online or press nine on the phone. And I, the first one I see is when, Wendy Thuring. Wendy, uh, can, you can go ahead. Hi, um, good evening. My name is Wendy Thuring. It's spelled W-E-N-D-Y-T-H-U-R-I-N-G. I live in Levine, Arizona, and I'm calling on behalf of the Mexican wolves. Um, and listening to the night's evenings, uh, speakers. It was fantastic. I think you'll notice that you had 
a lot more speakers registered to sign up to speak tonight than you had at the last meeting, which I think is great. I think you can probably see that by an overwhelming majority, you know, maybe we should take the plan back and rethink some of these things. And what I what I want to know is, I know it's not q and A's. I'm hoping that you guys can be flexible after listening to all of these people tell you how they feel. I'm hoping that maybe you guys can be flexible and perhaps maybe even, um, you know, put them back on the list. What would it hurt to put them back on the list for just one year? So what if you've got to do two extra things? If, if that means you've got to put them on the endangered list or if you've got to do articles A or B, who cares? I mean, let's, let's do that. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of us on this call tonight that would volunteer to help you. You know what I mean? So to me, if you've got the majority of the people and I think people are really having a problem with them not being put on that essentials list. I think if you guys were flexible and met us halfway and just put them back on that list, even if it's just for a year or two, I think that that might help. I think it really would. Um, what I do find absolutely disturbing is that all of this is for the ranchers, right? They're losing their livestock, they're losing money, but yet not a single rancher was on that call tonight, this call, except for the one lady, who went off on a tangent, I'm not sure what it was about. That's it, one rancher, one. And one guy that's a hunter that has a hunting club or directs the hunting club. I mean, come on, this is not, I, I just think that you guys should walk some of it back, maybe rethink it, meet us halfway, please. And that's all I'm asking. And I'm hoping that you guys will take these to heart. Thanks. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, Rick, did you? I, I think there was a couple other hands raised. I don't know if you caught those when they. They are. It's, it's still there. There's uh, Elena Tillman next with a raised hand. Go ahead, Elena. If... Hi, good evening. I, I guess after hearing that, I'm not sure what else I can add. I just want to go ahead and support uh, what what the previous woman had stated. And and uh, boy, did, boy, did she did she say it well? I just noticed the overwhelming majority of of folks, uh, and I don't think this is a skewed, and I don't think this is a skewed population of people, uh, you know, that that, that have spoken. Uh, sounds like the the vast the vast majority, uh, you know. You, 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 the people have spoken. I just want to second what the previous woman had said. There would be a huge number of people that would be in support of, of help. Like if help is, is, is the issue, if manpower, which I know as a, just as a general uh, state of affairs right now, I know man, manpower is low, man and woman power, uh, and that uh, everyone is overworked, overstressed, and is overtasked. Um, so I, I know that there would be people that would be willing to volunteer, myself included, wholeheartedly. Um, so yeah, I, I guess let let the the let's listen to the people. The people have definitely spoken. Thank you. Thanks, Elena. And Elena, could we get a spelling in your name as well, please? My apologies. My name's uh, Elena Tillman. E L E N A. Uh, last name Tillman. Uh, Tango India Lima Lima. Uh, Mike Alpha November. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Rick, you got someone else. I'm not seeing. I, them. I don't see any other hands raised at the moment. Uh, but if you'd like to speak, uh, there's uh, some additional ones. And then, likewise, for our folks on the phone, again, just a reminder: star nine to raise your hand if you'd like to offer a comment. Okay. There's so two. I see uh, Jeffrey and Paul uh, stacked up. Paul, uh, I, I don't, I don't see the, I don't see the list. Rick, Rick if you can read them off for me. Sure, uh, Jeffrey Sign and Paul Nelson. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Jeff Sign. Thanks again, I spoke already. So I just wanna clarify one point uh, that I take issue with. And that's that a lot of people have been quoting tonight numbers for population that 750 to 1000 is, is a good number to aim at. And I'm sorry, but if you look at breeding populations, you need probably 500 breeders that are healthy to maintain environmental uh, adaptability and that means a population of 2,500 to 3,000. So these numbers that are thrown around are so minimal. They're like, uh, they're, the, they're the bottom of the rung of what you would want to risk for a healthy population. And I just wanna make that point because I think a lot of people get numbers sometimes and those numbers get passed on for decades and nobody really looks at how large a population you need to have genetic variability enough with environmental changes, et cetera, 
for guaranteed health of a population of animals. And 750 to 1,000 does not do it. You need a larger, much larger number, and you need a larger range. These smaller numbers are minimal numbers that have been put out by scientists long ago, and they keep being bandied about by everybody, even environmentalists that don't really understand population genetics and dynamics enough to make that kind of a statement as a fact. So thank anyways, thank you guys for all your work. I appreciate uh, being able to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, Paul, if you could uh, state your name and, and, and spell your name for us, we'd appreciate it. Hello, uh, my name is Paul Nelson, P-A-U-L-N-E-L-S-O-N. And I'm also a resident of Texas and I'm a member of, I'm a board member of the Texas Lobo Coalition that Hope Carr spoke to earlier this evening. And I uh, just wanted to, um, first of all, thank you for your, this is a very tedious job facilitating these meetings and thank you guys for doing so and allowing us even extra time to speak. Very much appreciated and just being able to be part of this public comment period. Um, and I just wanted to say that, that there are folks in Texas next door to New Mexico who are supportive of your efforts um, to restore Mexican wolf populations. We, um, we welcome them. I know that there's been proposals in the past to have the uh, Guadalupe Mountain area included in the recovery area. And there is support for that here in Texas. And we are gonna be working with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department to try to influence them and, and, and let them know that there are supporters here who would welcome them back with open arms. And then I would just like to second, just uh, there's been so many comments made this evening. I've, uh, you know, we've, we've listened to them all and they've just been very profound. And, um, and you guys, you see the numbers, you see that Americans, we love our wildlife. We love our public lands. We love our nature. And um, we're very supportive of having a robust Mexican wolf um, population. And I do, I, I echo just the sentiment that I really, really hope that the agency will. Oops. Are you there, Paul? Uh, we lost, oh, we lost, lost your audio there briefly. Okay. Paul, if you can come back, we'll let you finish up. But um, is there anyone else who hasn't had a chance uh, to speak they yet? Supply, supply us a livelihood. And, um, and we very much respect that and appreciate that. And they need help. They're working on such small margins. They do need help and they do need support. Um, I don't think that this plan is, um, is doing the best for the wolves and the ranchers. I think we can get to a better middle ground where they're being provided more support and where wolves are being brought back to a point where they're, they're given adequate support to really establish a robust population um, free of, of artificial boundaries. And I thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. We, we missed about 10 or 15 seconds of you there. It blanked out. Um, so make sure you get those comments to us in writing as well. Um, uh, is there is there anyone else on the call that that um, hasn't had a chance to to comment? We we don't want to start back into in a dish, uh, second round of comments, but if there's someone that wants to speak and and hasn't had a chance yet, this now is the time. Okay, with that, um, we obviously greatly appreciate your time. Um, it's amazing. There's 70 people still on the call. Um, it's amazing that uh, everybody stuck with the whole thing so long and, and a testament to how much people care about this issue. Um, uh, remember, there's lots of ways to comment. Um, you can find it all on the website um, uh, or and comment uh, via regulations.gov or at the mailing address that we, we gave earlier. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brady again to, to adjourn, uh, close the meeting and, and adjourn, uh, uh, adjourn the meeting for the evening. Brady? All right. Thank you. And <clears throat> that concludes our public information session and hearing for this evening. I would like to close by thanking everyone who joined us. We look forward to continuing our efforts to recover the Mexican wolf with the support of the public, as well as our federal, state, travel, and local partners. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night.